The subcommittee will come to order. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes for an opening statement. The system that is currently used to pay physicians for providing services to beneficiaries in the Medicare system is broken and has been for some time. The dilemma that currently threatens doctors and Medicare beneficiaries alike is all too familiar. According to the most recent Congressional Budget Office estimate, if nothing is done, Physicians will see reimbursement for services provided to Medicare patients cut by 29.4% on January 1, 2012. This will have a disastrous effect on access to care for Medicare beneficiaries. According to surveys by the American Medical Association, faced with cuts of this magnitude, as many as 82% of physicians say, that they will need to make significant changes in their practices that will affect access to care. We have been here before. In fact, we have been in this situation for almost a decade. Since 2002, Congress has acted repeatedly to avert scheduled fee cuts. In 2010 alone, Congress passed one, uh, two one-month overrides, two two-month overrides, one six-month override, and most recently, for 2011, Congress passed a one-year override. All this was done without resolving the underlying problem. Meanwhile, the cost of fixing the problem continues to, to grow. In March, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that the price just to wipe out the accumulated debt and return to the baseline would be $298 billion. This staggering price tag is just one side of the physician payment reform problem. The current payment system is fundamentally flawed, and keeping the current system or making minor adjustments is no longer a viable option. Even maintaining the current system with 0% updates through 2020 would cost $275.8 billion. Too often, the discussion around physician payment reform has focused on the deficiencies of the current system and the urgent need to move away from the sustainable growth rate formula without a clear vision of the kind of system we want to replace it with. Essentially, all of us agree on the need for a new payment system, and there are a lot of good ideas about what an ideal payment system should look like. The witnesses that are participating in today's hearing bring a wealth of knowledge on this issue, and some of them have personal experience in design and administration of innovative systems. I want to thank the distinguished panel of experts that have taken the time to testify today. I'm encouraged that this hearing will go beyond merely describing the deficiencies of the current SGR system and will lead to a productive discussion of how we move to a system that reduces the growth in health care spending, preserves access to care for Medicare beneficiaries, and pays providers fairly based on the value, not the volume, of their services. And I yield the remaining time to the Vice Chair, Dr. Burgess. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And actually, I really mean this. Thank you for holding this hearing. It's been way too long. As I was telling one of our witnesses, I was 20 pounds lighter and a lot less gray the last time we held a hearing on Medicare physician payment. I'm also so relieved that we have five doctors on the panel. Seems like every time we've done this in the past, all we have are economists and lawyers. So doctors, welcome. And we know it's past time for action. I want to do my part to ensure that Medicare beneficiaries can continue to see their doctor, but it's just not going to happen if we don't fix this problem. Repeal is expensive, so stipulated, but it is also critical to the future for America's patients. Let's all accept the premise that it has, the SGR has to go, and this morning we are here to hear our witnesses focus on their solutions. I've always thought you start with a relatively simple question, what does it cost to, for a doctor to provide the service, and then you build in a reasonable profit for participation and coordination. But today we send all the wrong messages to our doctors. We say work harder and faster, deal with weekly expansions of services and regulations out of CMS. Non-physician bureaucrats will tell you how to practice and will do more so, in fact, under the president's new health care law. We're going to hold your checks, but we need you to take more patients. Practice costs are rising, but don't expect us to help you meet your costs. And, oh, by the way, a 30% pay cut in December. Is it any wonder that the country's physicians are fed up? We do need a true path forward. 
There may be three congressional committees who have a say on this issue, but it is this committee, the Committee on Energy and Commerce and the Subcommittee of Health, where the solution needs to come to light. I am a fee-for-service doctor. I always practice that way. I'll admit it has its problems, but so does linking payment rates to definitions of quality set by non-physicians. You need only look at the ACO regulation that recently came out of CMS. We've been testing models for years, and we've had multiple demonstration projects. But look, here's the bottom line. If we get to December and we're doing an extension, that's a failure on our part. We need a permanent solution that's predictable, updatable, and reasonable for this year, and nothing else will do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I yield back my time, can I ask unanimous consent that Dr. Harris, who's not a committee member, be allowed to, to sit at the dais? Without objection. Thank you. So ordered. Chair thanks gentlemen and recognizes the distinguished ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm pleased we're having a hearing in the Health Subcommittee on something other than repealing the Affordable Care Act, so I commend you for that initially. I'd also like to thank you for your willingness to approach today's critical issue in a bipartisan manner, and it's my hope that we move forward uh, in a bipartisan manner in the future on this issue. Uh, today's hearing is appropriate because you really must move beyond the sustainable growth rate in Medicare's payment policy. It's unstable, unreliable, and unfair. And we really must move beyond legislating SGR policy in month-long intervals. Uh, you know, I know last December when we passed a one-year fix, it was the 12th time we passed a patchwork bill in the last decade and the sixth time in one year alone. So we're not uh, saying <laughs> whose fault that is, but the fact of the matter is we need to stop kicking the can down the road. It's not fair to our nation's senior, seniors and it's not fair to our nation's doctors uh, it's a game of chicken that I think drives physicians out of Medicare and makes it harder for seniors to see a doctor. So the question remains, how do we fix it? The Democrats made an attempt when the House of Representatives considered and passed H.R. 3961, the only bill intended to permanently eliminate the large cuts required under the SGR that was ever passed by either body of Congress since the creation of the SGR in 1997. That bill would have reset the spending targets of the SGR and eliminated the accumulated deficit that generates the large annual cuts. It also would have set more realistic growth targets and promoted coordinated care by incentivizing accountable care organizations to control costs, a concept that was also embraced in the Affordable Care Act. Now, I'm not saying that uh, that bill was the perfect approach because nothing's perfect, but it certainly was a solution Unfortunately, we couldn't get it uh, passed into law signed by the president, so I don't have a perfect answer, but I know that getting a Medicare program with security and reliability for our seniors is a high hurdle. In that regard, I'd like to commend all the provider groups for their thoughtful responses to the committee's request for comments. If this is going to get done, we all need to be engaged, committed, and open-minded, and I look forward today to today's hearing and finally tackling this problem, as I said, on a bipartisan basis once and for all. I'd yield now uh, the remainder of my time to the gentleman from Michigan, our, uh, our uh, ranking member emeritus, Mr. Dingell. Mr. Chairman, I thank the gentleman, and I commend you for holding today's hearing. We address an intolerable situation that is only going to get worse as time passes. Each year since 2002, Congress has had to come in, and at the 11th hour, prevent cuts to providers' services and fees under Medicare. Due to our failure to fix this fatally flawed payment system, doctors and all other providers have been unable to plan for the future. The price tag has grown each year and is going to continue to do so. It's very clear to anyone who looks at it that we can no longer kick the can down the road. Last Congress, the House passed legislation I introduced, H.R. 3961 which would have repealed the SGR formula, ending the cycle of short-term patches and permanently improving the way Medicare pays its physicians and other providers. While I happen to think that my bill that passed the House last year was a good piece of legislation, I think we should explore all possible proposals. But we should keep in mind we have to get this miserable situ situation fixed. I am committed to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, and I look forward to passing a solution to this problem again this Congress. I hope that this time it will become law because the situation has become intolerable, 
and we are going to lose both the advantages and the benefits of Medicare as well as the cooperation, the goodwill, and the services of the different providers who are adversely affected by this miserable current situation. And I yield back to the gentleman from New Jersey the 49 seconds I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know if uh, any of my other colleagues would want the time. If not, uh, I'll yield back. Statement, Chair. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And now recognize the full committee chairman, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The opening paragraph of the original 65 Medicare legislation promised that the federal government would not interfere in the practice of medicine. This promise extended to government control over the administration of and compensation for medical services. Today, we know the federal government, through Medicare, sets irrational spending targets and administers the prices for more than 7,000 physician services. That's a long way from the original promise. In spite of the government interference and micromanagement, spending in Medicare has continued to grow at a rate that threatens to make the program financially insolvent. In 2009, fee-for-service Medicare spent about $64 billion on physician and other health professional services accounting for 13% of total Medicare spending and 20% of Medicare's fee-for-service spending. Clearly, something's got to change. Although we cannot afford the current rate of spending on physician services, we also know that if the pending 29.4% fee cuts are allowed to go into effect, a large good number of doctors will be forced out of Medicare and a large number of Medicare beneficiaries will lose their access to care. We're all well aware of the inadequacies of the sustainable growth formula as a payment policy, and we are also aware of the budgetary burden that failing to fix the problem has caused. Unfortunately, given the opportunity, the president decided that this issue, arguably the greatest threat facing Medicare, if not the entire health care system, would be left out of his health reform legislation. Today, we begin the chance to correct the omission. I thank our witnesses for taking time out of their busy schedule. We look forward to your testimony, and I yield my time to Mr. Barton. Thank you, uh, Chairman Upton, <clears throat> and we welcome Congressman Harris to the committee. He looks good here, and maybe one day he'll be here permanently. So, Thank you, Chairman Pitts and, and Ranking Member Pallone, for holding this hearing today. I remember very well back in 2006 when I had, we had lost the majority on the Republican side but we were in a lame duck session and uh, Congressman Dingell and Senator Baucus came to me as the chairman at that time and said let's work right now on the lame duck to fix the SGR and knowing how difficult it was to do I said no to that because I wanted them to have the fun of having to fix it. Um, in retrospect I should have taken them up on their offer and gone to then Speaker Hastert and said, let's get this done while we can, because the problem has only grown worse in the intervening four and a half years. The current system is broke, and you cannot fix it no matter how much we tinker with it. As Chairman Upton just pointed out, we're going to see a decrease in reimbursement of over 29 percent by next year if we do nothing. The deficit now in the SGR is in, at approximately $300 billion. Uh, that is a big number, even in Washington, where we have $3.5 trillion budgets and $1.5 trillion annual deficits. But it is a fixable problem if we really mean it when Mr. Dingell and Mr. Pallone and Mr. Waxman uh, say the same general things as Mr. Upton and Mr. Pitts and people like myself. So, Mr. Chairman, it is good that you're having this hearing. The last time we had a hearing of this sort, I was chairman of the full committee. The problem was big then, it's bigger now, but if we work together, we can fix it, and I hope that in this Congress, uh, on a bipartisan basis, we can do that. With that, I want to yield the balance of my time to, um, to Dr. Gingry. He has some comments he'd like to make. Mr. Chairman, I thank the former chairman of the committee for yielding to me. On the first day of uh, 2012, physicians face a 30 percent cut if we don't fix the current Medicare physician payment system. This is a problem that Congress created, and this is a problem that I expect Congress, not Republicans, not Democrats, but Congress, to fix. Dr. McClellan, in the past, you've been gracious 
enough to offer your insight on this issue to the GOP Doctors Caucus. Several of us on this panel are members. Uh, Dr. Murphy is, and, and I am, and we co-chair this uh, uh, caucus. We want to thank you for those efforts. Uh, as you know, the GOP Doctors Caucus has been discussing potential SGR reforms since the last Congress. We continue to explore ideas that might help solve the problem, including private contracting, allowing more flexibility in physician payment models, and encouraging greater quality measurements so that uh, we might lead to a, a greater outcome for patients. We look forward to continuing that work uh, and a working relationship with you and all of our witnesses today. I also want to thank uh, personally my good friend, uh, Dr. Todd Williamson from the great state of Georgia, in fact, former president of the Medical Association of Georgia. Todd, it's great to see you as a witness before the committee again today. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to start by acknowledging and welcoming the bipartisan interest in addressing the ongoing problem Medicare has in providing stability to support patient access to doctors. Too often we've been forced to the edge of the brink only to scramble at the last minute to avoid drastic cuts that would jeopardize access for Medicare beneficiaries and the military families in, under TRICARE. This is unacceptable to our physicians, to their patients, and to Medicare, and we have to find a better way. Whatever virtues the SGR had when it was created 14 years ago, and even then I didn't see much in it, I voted against it, it's clear that they have vanished. Six times in the last two years, the Congress had had to pass legislation blocking fee cuts of up to 21 percent or more, and cuts of that magnitude go to the very core of the program and would threaten the ability of seniors and persons with disabilities to see their doctors. Democrats in the last Congress uh, in the House passed the only bill ever that w by either body that would permanently solve the SGR problem. It did not become law. That's why we repeatedly worked to pass short-term patches to block the SGR. But that's not the way to solve the problem. It's essential that we find another way to get this done. But it is not enough to fill in the budgetary gap created by the SGR. We must work towards a new way of paying for care for physicians and all providers that encourages integrated care. We want patients to trust that their physicians are talking to each other. They're talking to their pharmacy, hospitals, and other providers about how to take care of the problems that exist and to prevent problems before they even arise. We want to achieve all three of the goals Dr. Berwick talks about, improving care for individuals, improving care for populations, and reducing costs. Right now, the way we pay for care doesn't always support these goals. The Affordable Care Act makes major strides to improve the way Medicare deals with physicians and other providers. New care models are supported by the ACA, including accountable care organizations and medical homes. Value-based purchasing is pursued across the continuum of providers in Medicare. And because we don't know what the payment system of the future will look like, the ACA opens an arena to innovative experimentation and cooperation with the private sector to identify the best path forward. Many of the physicians associated, associations responded to our request for comments, uh, 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 noted that the Affordable Care Act's opportunities for innovation and expressed a desire to pursue those opportunities in our effort to move beyond Medicare's current fee-for-service system. And I'd like to thank them, as did uh, uh, Ranking Member uh, Pallone, in suggesting uh, different alternatives for us to look at. I hope that this hearing will not focus, focus narrowly on options that would shift our problems paying for the SGR onto beneficiaries. I know that we do not have any beneficiaries on this panel. I don't know if we have any lawyers. I'm pleased we have some doctors. But the beneficiaries have some concerns as well. And I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit for the record a letter from the ARP and the Medicare Rights Center commending the committee's work on the SGR, but opposing proposals that would increase cost sharing under the guise of, quote, private contracting. 
I hope this hearing will be the beginning of a process that will lead to a permanent solution to provide both stability and better care for Medicare beneficiaries. I honestly hope we can work together on a bipartisan basis to solve this issue this year. And Mr. Chairman, I thank you for this uh, opportunity to make the statement, and I would like that you unanimous consent to put those letters in the record. Can we see the letters? Do you have a copy of the letters? Let's just take a look at them. Chair, uh, thanks, gentlemen, and uh, <clears throat> would like to uh, thank the witnesses for agreeing to appear before the committee this morning. Your willingness to take time out of your busy schedules underscores just how important this is to all of you and as it is to all of us. <clears throat> On March 28, 2011, the Energy and Commerce Committee sent a bipartisan letter to 51 physician organizations asking for input on reforming the Medicare physician payment system. The chair will introduce the responses from the following organizations as part of the permanent record. The American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, the American Academy of Dermatology Association, the Association of American Medical Colleges, the American Academy of Otolaryngology, AARP, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the American College of Rheumatology, the Alliance for Integrity in Medicine, the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the American Geriatric Society, the American Physical Therapy Association, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the American Society for Clinical Pathology, the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, the American Society of Hematology, the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, the American Neurologic Association, the American Academy of Neurology, the American College, uh, College of Surgeons, the Medical Group Management Association, the American College of Cardiology, the Society of Hospital Medicine, the Society of Nuclear Medicine, and the Society of Thoracic Surgery. Now, we received a lot of letters uh, last couple of days. As they're received, they'll be ex entered into the record. Um, have you finished looking at that? Long letter. <laughs> on both sides of the page. All right. Without objection, uh, the, the, your two letters will also be entered into the record. Let me introduce our panel at this time. The first witness is Dr. Mark McClellan. Dr. McClellan is former administrator for CMS, currently the director of the Engelberg Center for Health Policy Studies at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. The next witness is Dr. Cecil Wilson. Dr. Wilson is the current president of the American Medical Association. Next, Dr. David Hoyt is the Executive Director of the American College of Surgeons. Harold Miller is the Executive Director for the Center for Healthcare Quality and Payment Reform in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Professor Michael Chernow is Professor of Health Policy at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Todd Williamson is a practicing neurologist and representative of the Coalition of State Medical and National Specialty Societies. And our final witness is Dr. Ronald Gertz. He's the current president of the American Academy of Family Physicians. Your testimony will be entered, written testimony will be entered the record. We ask that you summarize your statements in five minutes. Uh, and Dr. McClellan, you may begin. Thank you, Chairman Ted, Representative Pallone, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I very much appreciate this opportunity to speak with you on the critical issue of Medicare physician payment. Physicians and the health professionals who work with them are the linchpin of our health care system. Unfortunately, is your microphone on? It, it is on. Maybe I'm not speaking quite. Just pull it a little is that closer. Better? Yeah, that's okay, better. Right, uh, right up to it. Um, unfortunately, finding a better way to both pay physicians adequately and address Medicare's worsening financial outlook has been very difficult. Frequent fixes to the sustainable growth rate formula for physician payment have meant that theoretical savings have not materialized 
and that physicians can't reliably plan ahead or fully cover their, their rising practice costs, let alone make needed investments in better ways to provide care that could also save money. The result is a frustrating gap for physicians between the care they are able to deliver while making ends meet in their practice and the care that should be possible in a more effective payment system. This is not a new problem. I testified before many of you on this distinguished subcommittee five years ago about the same issues, but it has become a more urgent problem, as many of you noted, from the standpoint of both quality of care for beneficiaries and the fiscal challenges facing Medicare. As Congress considers how to address this problem, I urge the subcommittee to look beyond approaches that remain tied to the existing formula simply by delaying it again or by resetting baselines to higher spending level. This is an opportunity to provide better support for physicians who lead in improving care. And the best starting point for doing so are the many practical ideas to improve quality and lower costs already being developed and implemented by physicians and other health professionals around the country, often in spite of Medicare payment rules. Payment reforms in the Medicare Modernization Act and the Affordable Care Act provide a foundation for this, as do many payment reforms being implemented now in states and in the private sector. But success in Medicare will require more than good ideas about payment reform. It will require real physician leadership. No one knows better where the best opportunities are to improve care and avoid unnecessary costs for their Medicare patients, and no one else will be trusted by Medicare beneficiaries. For example, oncologists have noted how much Medicare payments are tied to the volume and intensity of chemotherapy they provide. As Medicare reimbursement rates have been squeezed, the margin between what it costs to obtain chemotherapy drugs and what Medicare pays to administer them has become more important in covering their practice costs. At the same time, oncology practices get relatively little support for time spent working out a treatment plan that meets each individual patient's needs, for managing patient symptoms, for coordinating care with other providers. Some oncologists have partnered with private insurers to change this so they can get more support for the care that reflects the needs of their patients. They still get paid for costs related to chemotherapy, but instead of having to support their practice off chemotherapy margins, they receive a bundled payment that is no longer tied to giving more intensive chemotherapy. Instead, the bundled payment provides support for the treatment protocols that the physicians determine are most appropriate. In this example, the physicians were willing to take on more accountability for the quality of their care and for avoiding preventable complications and costs since it would allow them to focus more on what they are trained and professionally determined to do to get their patients the care they most need. There are many other examples of this, including in surgery and primary care and in many other areas uh, of uh, the delivery of care to Medicare beneficiaries. They all have some things in common that should be part of any payment reform legislation. They require a foundation of better data and meaningful, valid quality and cost measures. Most important is providing timely information on Medicare beneficiaries to providers. It is also important to take more steps to align Medicare's existing incentive programs with these clinical improvement efforts, like Medicare's meaningful use payments for health information technology and Medicare's quality reporting payments, as well as reforms affecting hospitals and cross-cutting reforms like accountable care organization payments. If they are aligned, these payments could add up to much more support for the investments of money and time needed to improve care. Medicare should also support promising payment reforms already being implemented successfully by private plans and states. In all of these efforts, more physician leadership is critical. These reforms will succeed not because we got the actuarial analysis right or we came up with the right names for all these complicated payment reforms, but because Medicare beneficiaries are seeing that their health care providers are getting more support to provide them with better care at a lower cost. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to assisting the subcommittee in addressing the difficult but critically important challenges of reforming Medicare physician payment. Thank you, Dr. McClellan. Dr. Wilson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Cecil Wilson. I'm the president of the American Medical Association and an internist in Winter Park, Florida. The AMA thanks the members of the subcommittee for your leadership in addressing the need to move beyond the SGR. And we look forward to collaborating with the subcommittee and Congress to develop Medicare physician payment reforms that strengthen Medicare. The SGR is a failed formula. The longer we wait to cast it aside, the deeper the hole we dig. It is past time to replace the SGR with a policy that preserves access, promotes quality, and increases efficiency. The AMA recommends a three-pronged approach to reforming the physician payment system. First, repeal the SGR. Second, 
implement a five-year period of stable Medicare physician payments. And third, during this five-year period, test an array of new payment models designed to enhance care coordination, quality, and appropriateness, and reduce cost. In addition, Congress should enact H.R. 1700, the Medicare Patient Empowerment Act. This bill would establish an additional Medicare payment option to allow patients and physicians to freely contract without penalty while allowing patients to use their Medicare benefits. The first prong of the AMA's approach, repealing the SGR, is critical. Since 2002, and you have, have alluded to this, Congress has had to intervene on 12 separate occasions to prevent steep cuts. But more than repeal is needed. Because of the uncertainty wreaked by the SGR over the past decade, a time of fiscal stability is imperative. So the AMA recommends five years of positive payment updates from 2012 through 2016. And I want to be clear, this would not be a five-year temporary delay of SGR cuts, but five years of statutory updates should be in conjunction with repeal of the SGR. This would allow time to carry out demonstration and pilot projects that would form the basis of a new Medicare physician payment system. And a replacement for the SGR should not be a one-size-fits-all formula. Instead, a new system should allow physicians to choose from a menu of new payment models, including shared savings, gain sharing, payment bundling programs across providers and episodes of care. Additional models are needed to embrace a wide spectrum of physician practices, including models focusing on condition-specific capitation, warranties for inpatient care, and mentoring programs. While these models are being tested, we also need evidence on how to properly structure and implement models which show the most promise while addressing complex issues such as effective risk adjustment and attribution. To assist with this process, the AMA is working with specialty and state medical societies to form a new physician payment and delivery reform leadership group. This group will include physicians who are participating in payment and delivery innovations. And by sharing expertise and resources, physicians can then assess the models that will improve patient care and that can be implemented across specialties and practice settings. They can also learn how to get the programs off the ground, address challenges, and assess the impact these of these reforms on patient care and practice economics. And the lessons learned can be widely disseminated to physician practices across the country as we move toward reform. The AMA recognizes that reforming the Medicare physician payment system is a daunting task. We are eager, however, to work with the subcommittee and all members of Congress to lay the groundwork for reform so that we can achieve the mutual and fundamental goal of strengthening the Medicare program for this generation and many generations to come. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to your questions. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. Just a quick announcement. We're in our first series of uh, votes for the day. Um, we will take one more uh, witness and then briefly recess at that time, reconvene immediately following those uh, two votes. Dr. Hoyt, you're recognized for five minutes. Surgeon and the Executive Director of the American College of Surgeons. On behalf of the more than 75,000 members of the college, I want to thank you for inviting the American College of Surgeons to testify today. The college recognizes that developing a long-term solution to the failing sustainable growth rate formula for Medicare payment is an enormous undertaking, particularly in light of the need to limit the growth in health care spending. The college understands that the current fee-for-service model is unsustainable and maintains that any new payment should be part of an evolutionary process that achieves the ultimate goals of increasing the quality of patient care, reducing the growth of health care spending. We assert that these two are directly related objectives. The first, toward reforming, the first step toward reforming Medicare payment formula is to immediately eliminate the SGR 
and set a realistic budget baseline for future Medicare payment updates. The new baseline should fairly reflect the costs of providing quality health care, preserve the patient-physician relationship, and ensure that patients have continued access to the physician of their choice. Following the elimination of the SGR, we believe it is essential to provide a transition period of up to five years to allow for testing, development, and future implementation of a wide range of alternative payment models aimed at improving quality and increasing the integration of care. To that end, the college is currently analyzing the role of creating bundled payments around surgical episodes of care. The primary goal of a bundled payment model is to improve the quality and coordination of patient care through the alignment of financial incentives for surgeons and hospitals. One approach to bundled payments combines payments to surgeons and hospitals for an episode of inpatient surgery into a single fee. The ideal surgical procedures to bundle include elective, high volume, and or high expenditure operations that can be risk adjusted and for which relevant evidence-based or appropriateness criteria exist. In order for a bundled payment to be successful, certain safeguards must be included, such as ensuring quality of patient care and physician-led decision-making about how and whom to whom the bundled payments are distributed. With the right approaches, we can improve both quality of patient care and at the same time reduce health care costs. The American College of Surgeons has been able to significantly improve surgical quality for more than 100 years in the specific fields of trauma, bariatric surgery, cancer, and surgery as a whole. These initiatives, initiatives reduce complications and save lives, which translates into lower costs, better outcomes, and greater access. Based on the results of our own quality programs, such as the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, or ACS NISQIP, we have learned that four key principles are required to measurably improve the quality of care and increase value. They are setting the appropriate standards, building the right infrastructure, using the right data to me measure performance, and verifying the processes with external peer review. The first, the core process that must be followed in any quality improvement program is to establish, follow, and continually reassess and improve best practice. Standards must be set based on scientific evidence so that surgeons and other health care providers can choose the right care at the right time given the patient's condition. It could be as fundamental as ensuring that surgeons and nurses wash their hands before an operation, as urgent as assessing and triaging a critically injured patient in the field, or as complex as guiding a cancer patient through treatment and rehabilitation. Secondly, to provide the highest level of quality care, surgical facilities must have in place appropriate and inadequate, and inadequate infrastructure, such as staffing, specialists, and equipment. For example, in emergency care, we know that hospitals have to have proper staff, equipment such as CT scanners, and infection prevention measures. If the appropriate structures are not in place, patients' risk increases. Third, we all want to improve the quality of care we provide for our patients, but hospitals cannot improve quality if they cannot measure quality. They cannot measure quality without valid, robust data which allow them to compare their results to, to others with similar hospitals or amongst similar patients. It is critical that quality programs collect risk-adjusted information about patients before, during, and after their hospital visit. Patient clinical charts, not insurance or Medicare claims, are the best sources of this type of data. And then finally, the final principle is to verify quality. Hospitals and providers must allow an external authority to periodically verify that the right processes and facilities are in place, that outcomes are being measured and benchmarked, and that the hospitals and providers are doing something to address the problems they identify. The best quality programs have long required that processes, structures, and outcomes of care be verified by an outside body. Emphasis on external audits will accompany efforts to tie payment to performance and rank the quality of care provided. <laughs> the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is intensifying the focus on quality. We believe that complications and costs can be reduced and care and outcomes improved on a continuous basis using these principles that I've outlined and should be the basis for payment reform. The college welcomes the heightened fo focus on quality. The evidence is strong. We can improve quality, prevent complications, and reduce costs. Most of all, this is good news for patients. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to share our college comments.
The chair thanks you, uh, Dr. Hoyt, for your recommendations, testimonies. The committee will stand in recess until 10 minutes after the second vote. The uh, recess having expired, we'll reconvene with the testimony, and we're up to Mr. Miller. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee. It's nice to be here with you today. Uh, I think the fundamental challenge that you as a committee and Congress are facing is the issue of how to control health care costs. And there's three fundamental ways that you can do that. One is you can um, cut benefits uh, or increase costs for the beneficiaries, which obviously you don't want to do. Second is to cut fees for physicians and hospitals, uh, which is obviously inappropriate and hasn't worked. Uh, and the third way is to change the way care is delivered. And that's really what I think we need to be focusing on is how to change care in a way that will reduce costs without rationing. And there's three basic ways that you can do that. One is by helping to keep people well so that they don't have health care costs at all. Uh, second is that if they do have something like a chronic disease to help them manage that in a way that avoids them having to be in the hospitalized. And if they do have to be hospitalized, to make sure that they don't get infections, complications, and readmissions. And all of those things save money, uh, but they also are improvements for patients, and I think the patients would find um, desirable. The problem that we have today, and the reason why we're talking about payment reform, is that the current payment system goes in exactly the opposite direction. Doctors and hospitals lose money whenever they prevent infections. We don't pay for many of the things that will help patients stay out of the hospital. And in healthcare, nobody gets paid at all when the patients stay well. So the incentives go in exactly the opposite direction. So there, there are ways uh, to uh, fix that. You don't fix it by changing the fee levels. You don't change it by adding more and more regulations. You do it by putting in fundamentally different payment models. And the two fundamental changes that are needed is, first of all, to be able to pay for care on an episode basis rather than on a service-by-service -service basis, having a single price for all the care associated with an episode uh, of a patient's treatment, and also including a warranty uh, against uh, not charging more for when infections or complications occur. This is the same way that every other industry in America charges for its products and services, a single price with a warranty, and it would be appropriate for health care, too. The other approach is to have uh, what I like to call comprehensive care payment, which is to have a single payment for a physician practice for all of the care that a patient needs to uh, manage their, the particular conditions um, that they have. Paying in that way provides the flexibility for physicians to de decide exactly what the right way is to for care to be delivered to that patient, as well as the accountability for overall costs. And where these programs have been tried, they have worked. Now, the myth that has developed is that only large integrated health systems can do this. Um, and because of the visibility of a number of large systems that have tried these things, I think that's where the myth has come from. But the truth is that there are small physician practices around the country that are also operating under these kinds of programs very successfully. And I think, like, again, like in every other industry where small businesses have been the innovators, I think that there is an also a very important opportunity here for small physician practices to be the innovators in this if we provide the right kind of support. Um, now, I've talked to physicians all over the country, and whenever they have the time to be able to understand them, I've found that they actually embrace these models. But they need the time to be able to transition, and they need support to be able to get there. Um, and there's really four kinds of support that they need. First of all, they need data and analysis of that data. Physicians today generally don't even know whether their patients are being hospitalized, whether they're going to the ER, how many duplicate tests they're getting. So in order to manage that, they have to have that kind of support. Second, they need training and coaching to be able to change the way they uh, deliver care. Uh, that kind of re-engineering is not taught in medical school, and it's very challenging to do it while you're still trying to deliver care. Third, physicians need transitional payment reforms so that they can start taking accountability for the things that they can take accountability for uh, without uh, uh, risking bankruptcy in the short run as they evolve towards these uh, broader payment models. And fourth, physicians need to have all payers, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial payers, paying them the same way. Otherwise, they're spending more time trying to administer different payment systems. 
Now, the best way to organize this, I don't think, is through a one-size-fits-all federal program. I think it needs to be done at the community level because care is structured and delivered differently in every community. Um, and in a growing number of communities around the country, there are now entities called regional health improvement collaboratives. These are nonprofit, multi-stakeholder entities. They don't deliver care, they don't pay for care, but they help to provide the kind of data and analysis and technical assistance to physician practices to be able to evolve in this direction. And I think that Congress can help these regional collaboratives in three key ways. One is by providing them data. Today, it is impossible to get data from Medicare to know how you're doing for Medicare patients if you want to change that. Second, you can give them some modest federal funding to support what they're doing. Uh, and when I say modest, I'm talking millions, not billions. And third, you can encourage or require Medicare to participate in the cases where they have developed multi-payer payment reforms already at the local level. The big thing that they are missing is having Medicare at the table, and I think that's going to be a very important strategy to support that. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or provide any help. Thank you for those excellent recommendations. Uh, Dr. Chernow, five minutes. Ranking member Pallone and Mr. Miller for putting my mic on, and members of the Subcommittee on Health for inviting me to testify on innovative physician payment systems that might be, a, that might be useful alternatives to the sustainable growth rate system that ironically has proven not to be sustainable. Before I commence with my substantive remarks, I would like to emphasize that my comments reflect solely my beliefs and do not reflect the opinions of any organization I'm affiliated with, including MedPAC. Critiquing the SGR is easy, yet identifying a viable alternative to the SGR is difficult. There is unlikely to be a perfect solution, and any path to a solution will take time. That said, I think that increasingly the private sector has developed uh, promising alternatives. I will discuss one option I consider particularly promising today, the alternative quality contract implemented by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, known uh, commonly as the AQC. But before launching into a description of the AQC, I would like to speak broadly about payment reform. First, it is important to distinguish between the form of payment, fee-for-service versus bundled, and the level of payment. The form of payment creates incentives in, in, that influence behavior, but even the best payment system can function poorly if payment rates are set too low or even too high. Second, while I recognize that I have been asked to discuss physician payment, the question presupposes a fragmentation that I, of payment that I think is detrimental. Specifically, the existing Medicare system including the SGR, structures payment by provider type. This creates numerous inequities and paradoxes that makes managing the system and improving coordination of care across settings difficult. A more bundled system that pays for an episode of care or provides a global budget can allow more flexibility for providers and limit the need for purchasers such as Medicare or private insurers to micromanage payment systems. In a bundled payment model, the relevant question is not how do we pay physicians, but instead how do we pay for care. Implementing a bundled system is not easy, but Innovative systems do exist, and at a minimum, our experience demonstrates their feasibility and, I believe, promise. The AQC is one such system. Briefly, the AQC is integrated into the Blue Cross Blue Shield HMO product and rests on three fundamental pillars. First, a global payment in which provider systems receive a budget to cover the costs of providing all of an enrollee's care. Second, the AQC incorporates a comprehensive pay for performance system that rewards provider groups for performance on 64 quality measures, ranging from process measures to outcome measures, from clinical measures, to patient experience measures, and third, the AQC includes a significant data and analytic support for participating physician groups which helps them identify areas to target for improvement and training and other things as well. Um, the AQC differs from the capitation plans of the 1990s because the contract extends for five years and because of the robust quality program and data support. The model has several strengths. Most importantly, it creates a business case for improving quality and efficiency. In contrast to fee-for-service systems, innovative programs that reduce the use of unnecessary or inefficient care are profitable under the AQC. <laughs> the global budget also provides stability and predictability of spending growth, and the five-year contract duration and the requirement that patients designate a physician greatly facilitates management and accountability. Global payment systems in the past have raised several concerns. For example, many have worried that they would lead to a lower quality of care. The AQC is designed to prevent this by setting the global budget at least equal to the prior year payment so no provider group will be forced to uh, reduce access to care and by incorporating the quality bonus system. Early evidence suggests that these features have led to an increase, not decrease, in the quality of care delivered. Further, many observers have noted that not all physician groups are capable of functioning in a global budget environment. Certainly this is true, but just because all groups are not ready for bundled payment does not mean we should abandon it, and I would support a, a multiplicity of approaches. Moreover, I tend to have a free market orientation that suggests providers will adapt. In fact, 
if we do not believe such transformation is possible, no amount of payment reform or other policy changes will solve our problems, and we are doomed to a system that operates far below our aspirations. Moreover, many solo and small practices participate in the AQC as part of the larger independent practice associations, which demonstrate that the model can succeed outside of large integrated group practices. The AQC is not without its weaknesses. For example, the AQC is not tied to benefit design, and I believe a greater integration with value-based insurance design would be an improvement. Second, while I'm a big believer in markets, any private sector model must contend with issues of provider market power. Because of its size, Blue Cross Blue Shield may be better positioned to do this than other smaller plans. So far, the AQC has passed the test of the market, with enrollment growing from 26% to 44% of Blue Cross Blue Shield HMO membership as more provider groups have chosen to join. Some AQC principles are already evident in the recently proposed accountable care organization regulations and in several other bundled payment demonstrations. Broad application of such models would be facilitated in Medicare if beneficiaries were incented or required to designate a physician without giving up existing benefits or rights regarding choice of provider. In summary, a fee-for-service physician payment system for Medicare, SGR or not, generates inherent problems. Bundled payment systems such as the AQC offer considerable promise as a way forward. These systems are comprehensive and give autonomy to providers which ultimately will be preferable to other, other strategies to control spending. Thus, I urge you to support ongoing bundled payment demonstrations and others like them, which will create a more rational and effective payment system that allows our expectations and aspirations to be met in a fiscally sustainable manner. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Williamson, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning. My name is Todd Williamson. I'm a board-certified neurologist, and I treat patients every day in my office in Lawrenceville, Georgia, just northeast of Atlanta. I would like to express my sincere thanks to Chairman Pitts and Ranking Member Pallone and the members of this committee for the opportunity to address the critical issue of Medicare's broken physician payment system. As background, I had the honor of serving as the president of the Medical Association of Georgia in 2008 and 2009. I currently serve as the spokesman for the Coalition of State, Medical, and National Specialty Societies, which includes 16 associations representing nearly 90,000 physicians from across the country. The full membership list is in our written statement. Medicare is the nation's largest government-run health care program, and it represents the most glaring example of the need for change. As everyone in this room knows, the current SGR system is failing to serve our nation's seniors and physicians. As the gap between government-controlled payment rates and the cost of running a practice grows wider, physicians are finding it increasingly difficult to accept Medicare patients. Our coalition is therefore convinced that the key to preserving our Medicare patients' access to quality medical care is overhauling the flawed Medicare payment system. To address this problem, our coalition supports the Medicare Patient Empowerment Act as an essential part of any Medicare reform. This legislation would establish a new Medicare payment option, whereby patients and physicians would be free to contract for medical care without penalty. It would allow these patients to apply their Medicare benefits to the physician of their choice and to contract for any amount not covered by Medicare. Physicians would be free to opt out or in of Medicare on a per-patient basis, while patients could pay for their care as they see fit and be reimbursed for an equal amount to that paid to participating Medicare physicians. Patients and physicians should be free to enter into private payment arrangements without legal interference or penalty. Private contracting is a key principle of American freedom and liberty. It serves as the foundation for the patient-physician relationship and it has given rise to the best medical care in the world. It should therefore be a viable option within the Medicare payment system. Private contracting will help the federal government achieve fiscal stability while fulfilling its promise to Medicare beneficiaries. A patient who chooses to see a physician outside the Medicare system should not be treated as if they don't have insurance. Medicare should pay its fair share of the charge and allow the patient to pay any remaining balance. Private contracting is also the only way to ensure that our patients can maintain control over their medical decisions. The government has the right to determine what it will pay toward medical care, but it does not have the right to determine the value of that medical care. This value determination should be ultimately made by the individual patient. While private contracting would allow physicians to collect their usual fee in some instances, it would also allow them to collect less in others. It is reprehensible for a physician to be subject to civil and criminal penalties if he or she doesn't collect a patient's copayment 
as is now the case. It is irrational for a senior who wants to see a doctor outside the usual Medicare system to be forced to forfeit their Medicare benefits. This simply isn't fair to someone who has paid into the Medicare system their entire working life. The day the Medicare Patient Empowerment Act becomes law, every physician will become accessible to every Medicare patient. Private contracting is a sustainable, patient-centered solution for the Medicare payment system that will ensure our patients have access to the medical care they need. In summary, Medicare patients should be free to privately contract with a doctor of their choice without bureaucratic interference or penalty. This will empower individual patients to make their medical care decisions while providing the federal government with more fiscal certainty. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today. Chair, thanks, gentlemen, and recognizes Dr. Gertz for five minutes. Chairman Pitts, Mr. Pallone, and members of the subcommittee, I'm Dr. Roland Gertz from Waco, Texas, president of the American Academy of Family Physicians. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of over 100,000 members of the AAFP. I commend your bipartisan commitment to finding a solution to this critical problem. Congress, understandably, is most concerned with controlling federal expenditures for health care, especially the rising costs of Medicare. There is growing and compelling evidence that a health care system based on primary care will help control these costs, as well as increase patient satisfaction and improve patient health. We recommend reforms that eventually include a blended payment model that consists of the following three elements. One, some retention of fee-for-service payment. Two, a care coordination fee that compensates for expertise and time required for primary care activities that are not now paid for. And three, performance bonuses based on quality. Simply reforming the fee-for-service system, which undervalues primary care preventive health and team-based care coordination, cannot produce the results that Congress and patients require. The, the solution to our dilemma of rising health care costs and stagnating quality will be complex, but it must include greater use of transformed team-based primary care. The evidence for the value of primary care in restraining costs and improving quality is very clear when that care is delivered in a team-based, patient-centered medical home. Growing evidence with PCMH and coordinated systems, particularly those that emphasize improved access to primary care teams, shows that they can reduce co total costs, total overall costs, by 7 to 10 percent, largely by reducing avoidable hospitalizations and emergency room visits. We believe that as a policy goal, Congress should invest in Medicare reforms that increase primary care payments so they represent approximately 10 to 12 percent of total health care spending, particularly if done in ways that improve access to a broader array of services. Currently, primary care is just 6 to 7 percent of overall total Medicare spending. So medical home projects, when, in, in, when implemented, recoup that, the entire cost of that implementation. To produce the savings Congress requires, primary care cannot remain unchanged. AEFP has already taken the lead in urging its, its members' practices to change, but such transformation will take time. That's why we recommend a five-year transition period. This will provide an opportunity to examine what works and to allow physicians to adopt those best practices that use a blended payment. When this transition is complete, fee-for-service should be much less significant portion of physician payment. Meanwhile, it is important to increase the primary care incentive payment to 20 percent and maintain the support for making Medicaid payments for primary care at least equal to Medicare's payments for the same services. Both of these programs, along with the mandated payment updates that are 2 percent higher for primary care, will help stabilize current practices that have been so much, seen so much financial turmoil in the past few years and will allow them to begin the process of redesign to the patient-centered medical home model. During the five-year period of stability, it will be crucial to encourage as much innovation as possible. The new CMS Center for Innovation needs to be a key focus of this effort. We believe that this center can help CMS create market-based, private sector-like programs that can significantly bend the health care cost curve. We recommend that CMS Innovation Center coordinate the various health care delivery models to ensure comparability and completeness of data. The physician community has always believed strongly in the value of evidence, and it is the responsibility of the Innovation Center to provide 
credible, reliable, and usable evidence for health system change. When implementation data becomes available, we would encourage Congress to engage in another discussion with the physician community, with public and private payers, with consumers, to determine not just what works, but what is preferred. In the final analysis, healthcare is such an important part of the economy and everyone's lives that we should try to find general agreement in what becomes the final replacement for the current physician payment model. Mr. Chairman and members of this subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to share the views of family medicine with you today. Chair, thanks to the panel for their opening statements, and uh, I will now begin the questioning and recognize myself for five minutes. Dr. Williamson, you advocate allowing physicians to privately contract with beneficiaries above Medicare payments. One concern with this arrangement is that sick, pa sick patients may be at a disadvantage entering into a contract without sufficient knowledge about what they need or about the quality of care they're contracting for. Is there a way to structure this so that patients have more information about what they're contracting for? For example, uh, could you combine private contracting with quality measurement and reporting or other tools such as shared decision making? Would you respond to that, please? Thank you for the question, and that's a great question. I understand those concerns, and, and I would point out several, several items about the Medicare Patient Empowerment Act. Number one, there's a lot of openness in this act. Patients have to agree up front what they are uh, agreeing to before any care is delivered. Uh, number two, this is merely an option within the current existing Medicare system. So this would not change any of the current ways that Medicare is financed otherwise. There are sufficient protections, we believe, already existing in the, in the current Medicare Patient Empowerment Act as written so that urgencies or emergencies as currently defined under Medicare would be exempt from private contracting. And also dual eligible patients, those patients that are most impoverished that are eligible for Medicaid would not uh, uh, be uh, eligible for private contracting. Uh, in, in terms of uh, linking private contracting with quality measures and the other items that you outlined, uh, this is something that physicians are trained to do. And I would uh, say in, with uh, respectful disagreement to some of the things that, that were said today, physicians are taught in medical school how to control costs. They are taught how to communicate with their peers. They are taught how to analyze data. This is something that we're taught from the very first day of medical school. I took a course called analytical medicine. And these things are already integral. Uh, could we do more to emphasize these things? Absolutely. But I think within the Medicare Patient Empowerment Act, there are sufficient protections to address your concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hoyt. <clears throat> your organization has done a lot of very good work on quality measures. Can you give us an assessment of where we are today in terms of measuring quality? Are we just measuring processes? Or can we also measure outcomes? How close are we to being able to uh, come up with a metric that will help us decide how to pay for quality? Thank you. Um, yes, I think the way to characterize quality programs today is that uh, probably the best example would be the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, or NISQIP, where outcomes in addition to processes of care can be measured. A very specific example, the implementation of that program in 112 hospitals over a three-year period reduced complications, major surgical complications, by about one complication per day per hospital. If you ascribe about $10,000 to an average complication, which is probably a low figure, and multiply that out, that turns out to be a savings of about $2.5 million per hospital. If you roll that kind of program across all 4,000 hospitals, you're talking potentially billions of dollars each year saved from one program. You add to that comparative effectiveness, you add to that other cost reduction strategies, and I think that, that physicians can bring a lot. But the quality program uh, uh, tool, if you will, is, is proven. Thank you. Uh, Dr. McClellan. There are several moving parts to this puzzle. On the one hand, there are a number of forces pushing providers away from traditional fee-for-service towards 
the newer payment and delivery systems such as the ACOs and bundling payment agreements and medical homes, even captation models. Yet on the other hand, it seems that fee-for-service will continue to have a role, at least for the foreseeable future. As we put uh, the effort into developing these newer payment and delivery systems, what can we do to fee-for-service to make it less inflationary and more value-based? Mr. Chairman, I, I agree with you. I think fee-for-service in Medicare is going to continue to play a significant role for some time. I think what you've heard from the panel today is that there are a lot of ways, including proven ways, to help make fee-for-service work more effectively with these other kinds of reforms. And you know, if you, you, some of the reforms that you mentioned that are taking place in hospital payments and other parts of the Medicare program, the episode payments involving hospitals, the accountable care, payments, it would be very helpful if physicians could get better financial support in their own payment system to enable them to lead all of those efforts. And right now, with fee-for-service staying the way it is, they're, they're staying behind. So uh, I think there's some real opportunities for alignment. We're not talking about, you know, radically changing the system, discarding all fee-for-service payments now. But again, especially if these efforts can start with physician-identified and physician-led efforts like you just heard about from Dr. Hoyt. They, they have the performance measures. These are things that uh, Medicare could be paying to report on as part of its quality. Panel reminding me of the bill uh, which I mentioned in my opening that the House passed, uh, I guess, last year or the year before, which addressed the SGR problem in a larger sense. That was the Medicare Physician Payment Reform Act of 2009, H.R. 3961. Um, now, I'm not suggesting we simply go back to that now because the Affordable Care Act creates a lot of new opportunities for fixing the SGR that we should build off today. But that bill, H.R. 3961, would have fixed the problem. And so I'd like to get uh, Mr. Gertz's thoughts on, um, you know, on it. Uh, it as, as you may recall, it provided a guaranteed update during a transition to a new payment system. It would have created fairer growth targets by eliminating items not paid under the physician fee schedule. It would have provided an extra growth allowance for primary care services and allowed ACOs to opt out of the spending targets. So I just wanted to ask Mr. Gertz about your thoughts on this legislation, what you like about it, and what maybe we could do better now that we are post-Affordable uh, Care Act. In about one minute. <laughs> <laughs> I might be able to give you a one-minute response, but it won't cover all those topics. I know, I know. <laughs> Uh, I, our organization, uh, I, I don't remember the exact position on that legislation that we, take, that we took, but if it, if it satisfies the three elements that I mentioned, because fee-for-service has inherent po uh, positives and negatives. The positive is that it, it incents you to work harder. The negatives is that it, it is in, in, inherently inflationary. So there's got to be some control on that. So we believe that if you put a, a patient coordination fee element into that, that allows us to, to increase the things that we don't get paid for in communication with patients and the rest of other, the other physicians and team members that are needed, it will work. It will work. Now, the way the current model works, it just simply puts everybody in one pool and treats them all the same way. Uh, the quality measures are mainly process right now, but we are making big uh, uh, strides in getting to the outcome decisions that are necessary for that. And what mix of those three things eventually evolve, I think are going to be very, uh, very interesting to watch. I don't know what the answers are, but all three work synergistically to have a better system than any one of them by themselves. Well, thank you. Now, you mentioned fee-for-service. Let me ask Dr. McClellan the second question. Um, are there examples where physicians or provider-led organizations have stepped up to do the right thing, you know, under fee-for-service, and the payment system has hurt them from doing that? Uh, you, you suggested that there might be cases, but... You know, you give me an example maybe where physicians were actually financially punished for doing the right thing, and, you know, I mean, that's the, that's the last thing I'd like to see happen. Lots of examples. One of the first meetings I had as CMS administrator was with the leaders of a number of group practices that were doing things like working with nurse practitioners and pharmacists to do support for adherence to medications, forming uh, transition teams to help prevent readmissions, point out that Medicare pays for none of that, and to the extent that it works, they could bill less for the things that Medicare does pay for. Another uh, good example is Virginia Mason Medical Center in Seattle that implemented some steps to lower costs and improve outcomes for patients with common problems like back pain, 
they were penalized financially and it's made it very difficult for them to sustain their program. All right, well, thanks. Now, Liz, Dr. Wilson, uh, you, you, uh, you know, I want to commend your proposal. Um, it's clear that the AMA and the two other societies seated with you today took our request seriously and put some time into the response. Um, but I'm wondering if you could just attempt to give us your view of the consensus amongst the physician community, if any, uh, and what we should do about the problems with the physician payment system. Is there a consensus at this point, would you say? I don't know if that mic is on. Yes, and I, I think you heard that uh, this morning, that around certain principles, and that is we have a payment system that does not work. We need to get rid of it. Uh, we need to have a period of stability as we move to a different way of delivering care and paying for care. And you've heard a variety of options about models that be, might be effective. I, I think there's, there is a great deal of consensus around that. Now, when we get down to, to the fine ink, uh, to the fine print, uh, clearly we will all have differences about what will work. But I, I think we should also have a realization that what will work in one part of the country and, and, and will not work in another part of the country. And that's why we have continued to talk about a variety of options not picking a one size that we expect will fit all. I, I can take you uh, to my home state of Florida where work, what works in the panhandle doesn't work in central Florida where I live and doesn't work in south Florida. So I think we need to keep that in mind. Uh, there is a temptation to feel like we ought to figure out one rule and that solves it all. Uh, this system is so complex that we need to pr preserve that. And as a matter of fact, uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, in, in talking about accountable care organizations, I think recognize that. It, it talked about a variety of models for those structures that, that would work. I, I think we need to keep that in mind. But uh, I, I am impressed also as I go around the country talking to physicians. Uh, they understand we, there are ways that this can be done better, and they want to be involved in the process. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> the chair now recognizes the distinguished chairman of the full committee, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Pitts. And uh, again, I just want to re reiterate uh, uh, from this committee's uh, viewpoint that I very much appreciate all of the input, not only from you today, uh, but the dozens of organizations that responded to the letter that was bipartisan that Mr. Waxman and I and, and others signed uh, looking for information. Uh, this is on our short list of uh, getting things done uh, really this summer. Uh, I've got a number of different things that are there, but this is, this is a, an issue that we need to grapple with. It's time. It's, we're way too late, and I appreciate the uh, expertise, the questions of particularly uh, Dr. Burgess, the vice chair of the, of the subcommittee, in addition to Mr. Pitts, Mr. Plone, Mr. Waxman, and others. I personally, I like the idea of taking the time, a number of different years, uh, to look at a whole number of different models and see what might work best. I know from my district's perspective, uh, I've got some pretty urban areas in terms of a Kalamazoo with two great hospital uh, facilities with lots of physicians, Borges and Bronson, uh, as well as Lakeland Hospital in the county that, that I live on. And I've got some counties that, frankly, uh, are very rural. Uh, some that don't even have a four-lane road, uh, practically. And, and uh, uh, so it's, uh, we are a diverse nation and uh, different health care, and we need to look at uh, those different priorities uh, that are there for sure. And I just uh, want to, again, appreciate your time today. The question that I have, and uh, I want to focus this first at Professor Cherno, but uh, others might want to comment. You know, the IPAB was created by the Affordable Care Act, as we all know, uh, a number of folks on both sides of the aisle have expressed concern about the board and how it functions. For one thing, as we know, the, the board sets expenditure targets and poses spending cuts based on those targets. And we know that beginning in 2018, the target will be based on GDP. Sounds a lot like SGR, uh, which we're trying to get rid of. And since hospitals are exempt from IPAB cuts through the rest of the decade, it seems that the IPAB has the potential to undermine any serious efforts at physician payment reform. And I'd like to get your comments as, as it relates to that. So we'll start with Professor Chernow. Anyone else that would like to comment would be great. Well, first let me say go blue. Yeah, having, absolutely. Right, yeah, I, having been at Michigan for 15 years. Um, but we lost the basketball guy this week. I don't know if you heard um, 
I, I think the IPAB is yet an unknown quantity. I think at its best, it could be supportive of all the things that one does here, and at its worst, it could uh, create problems that uh, you discuss. And I think the challenge, like much of aspects of the ACA, is how to implement the proposals. What you've heard here around the table about payment reform, I think is a stunning uh, consensus about both the problems of the SGR, I heard it um, from the uh, chairman and the others who spoke, and the notion that uh, reforming payments is going to have some basic principles, and you mentioned some, the others mentioned the transition and stuff. And I, w I would like to think that the IPAB can be used as a tool to uh, backstop if problems arise in those, but I certainly think that if one isn't careful in various ways, they there would be concerns. And so like most things, the devil's going to be in the details, and how to make it work is uh, a bigger question than, um, than one can address in the, t in the time that we have here. Anybody else like to comment? Our coalition has opposed the IPAB um, for a number of reasons. Some have, have been stated. Uh, we have concerns about the fact that it's comprised of non-elected officials with minimal accountability and the fact that its recommendations would automatically become law if the Congress didn't act within a fairly short period of months. So our coalition has opposed that entity. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the AMA from the start has said that this, uh, the um, Affordable Care Act uh, is a big step forward to health system reform, but it is just a step, and there are some challenges associated with it. There are things that were left out, and that's medical liability reform, uh, as well as a fix uh, for the Medicare physician payment. And there are some things in the bill that we have problems with, and one of them is the Independent Payment Advisory Board, the IPAB, uh, as it is presently structured, we do not support it. Uh, our concern is, and maybe this would be a good place to float this, and that is 20 years from now we might be sitting here, some of us, uh, talking about how to correct the problems associated with it. So we, uh, it, it is not impossible that it could serve a function, but it, as presently constituted, we, could, we see it basically another target for physicians to meet potential double jeopardy with an SGR as well as the, the pronouncements from this body. So uh, we believe significant changes need to be made. Great. I know my time has expired. I just want to add that tort reform is also on our short list of getting things done. So thank you very much. Chair, thanks, gentlemen, and now recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Michigan, the ranking member emeritus, uh, Mr. Dingell, for five minutes. Questions? Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy. And I would like to direct my attentions to Dr. Wilson, Dr. Gertz, and Dr. Hoyt. Uh, and I would like to do this against the background of getting their helpful and necessary advice on how we will proceed to solve a problem that's going to cost more every year. Now, gentlemen, uh, like all of you, I believe we have to change or repeal the seriously fraud SGR formula. Each of you seems to be in agreement that a five-year stability period is needed for Medicare physician payments to allow providers to plan ahead, as well as to allow demonstration projects to test different payment models. Is a five-year stability period an adequate amount of time to phase out SGR and for physicians to prepare for a new payment system? Yes or no? In other words, is five years enough time to do the job? If you, want to, if you want to qualify that, I'll be glad to receive that for the record. <laughs> Doctor, I hate to be, be discourteous, but I've got a lot of questions. If I get yes or no, I'll get I'll get get through them. Uh, Dr. Gertz, Dr. Hoyt, uh, we would commit to a five-year period to do everything possible to make the transition. Dr. Hoyt, I, I would agree. All right. Now we've heard from many of you about the need for demonstration projects. How many demonstration projects would be necessary to determine the effectiveness of a new system? Uh, starting with Dr. Wilson, just horseback answer. True. And 
Uh, the other two panelists, please. Well, I, I, I would p posit to you that at least for the elements that I'm talking, have referred to the patient-centered medical home, I think there are more than enough demonstration projects that already show the benefit of that. Now, if you're talking about overall change, I think you're going to have to have enough demonstration projects that represent all the regions of the country, all the demographic uh, variations that are appropriate, but I don't think that has to be a, uh, an onerous number. Thank you, Doctor. And I, I don't know the number, but particularly in surgery, we would need demonstration projects that fulfill the needs of surgeons practicing in already integrated health systems like Geisinger or Kaiser, but then we have 55% of our members that are still practicing in solo or small group practice, and solutions for them uh, are needed as well. Now, the same, same panelist, if you please. Um, I introduced in the prior Congress H.R. 3961. That included reforms that may offer some uh, solutions to the current payment problems. As you're well aware, next January, Medicare physicians are facing a 29.5% cut if the SGR problem is not redressed. Um, do you have any feelings that H.R. 3961 would have prevented the 29.5% cut we're expecting in January, yes or no? Doctor? Yes, it would have definitely helped. Doctor? Yes. Uh, one of the proposed reforms included in H.R. 3691, or rather 3961, was creating two categories of physician services, one for evaluation management and preventive services, and the second to cover all other services. Primary and preventive services would be permitted to grow at GDP plus 2 percent, while other services would be allowed to grow at the rate of GDP plus 1 percent. Uh, do you think this is a good idea, yes or no? Thank you, Doctor. Doctor? I, we certainly ascribe to the rebalancing that the primary care elements would have done. The overall bill, I don't know also. Now, um, we have a whole series of problems here, one of which is we're putting target limits on all kinds of services being paid for by Medicare. Should we limit spending targets to physician services, or should we cover all other kinds of services? Starting with Dr. Wilson, if you please. Uh, Sorry, I, I think if we're going to have targets, they should include the health system in general. I think what we're understanding uh, dealing with the SGR, that targets are, are not very effective way to do what we want to do. Thank you, Dr. White and, and, and Dr. Hurt. Uh, the, unless you consider the overall health care system, you can't make it efficient. I note, Mr. Chairman, I am over my time. Thank you for your courtesy. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Um, and recognizes the distinguished vice chairman of the subcommittee, a gentleman from Texas, Dr. Burgess, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there's so much to ask. We always do reserve the right to submit questions in writing. I will not get through the, the list of things in front of me. And I know that these are not yes or no questions. I'm a, Dr. Wilson and Dr. McClellan, whoever feels most comfortable answering this, or both of you, um, actually, Dr. McClellan, your uh, old boss at Department of Health and Human Services, Mike Levitt, had a, a demonstration project that the physician group practice demonstration project that now has moved into the ACO realm. And many of us were somewhat excited about the concept of ACOs, and a lot of the Medicare payment reform perhaps could have been tied to the ACO. But then a couple of weeks ago, we got the rule out of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, with which you're intimately familiar, and it was almost unreadable and certainly unworkable. So now that everyone knows what a unicorn is, I don't think any exist in practice, do they? Well. As you know, uh, the, the regulatory process involves steps, and especially in new areas like this one, um, there are going to be lots of comments on whatever the agency puts out first. And I've heard some um, statements recently from some of the leadership at CMS that they're definitely listening closely to the comments. They want to um, address some of the issues that have been raised about the proposed regulation. 
Um, I don't think that, like many of the other ideas that we've talked about here today, though, that we're, we're just talking about unicorns in terms of doing reforms and payment that support physician leadership in improving care and lowering costs. There are a number of ACO-like programs in existence now. Uh, Dr. Chirnu talked about the Massachusetts Blue Cross uh, alternative quality contract. That has a lot of new kinds of support for physicians for the kinds of delivery reforms that we've talked about. Dr. Hoyt talked about a lot of experience with episode yeah, well, payments that have helped surgeons. Let me interrupt you for a moment because I know you know so much about this and I am going to ask you to respond to part of this in writing. But but under the under the rule that came out, I, I don't know that they that they could exist and perhaps they can respond to me in writing about whether or not their their programs could continue to exist. Dr. Wilson, you talk a little bit about physician leadership and any this is going to be so critical. Whatever, whatever evolves as the answer to this conundrum, it is going to take physician leadership. And, and what are you doing now as the head, the consummate insider of organized medicine in the free world? What are you doing to, to recruit that physician leadership? We all know what it, whatever it is, doctors don't like anything moving in their cage. We don't like change. But when it happens, it's going to take champions within the profession to lead that change. Uh, how are you preparing for that? Well, thank you, Congressman. I assume that means in addition to praying. <laughs> um, the, the AMA is actually devoting a great deal of its resources to, to trying to provide information to physicians uh, through uh, papers on this subject, uh, through webinars, through information on our website, through seminars around the country to help physicians uh, understand what an ACO might look like and understanding that the definition is fluid and that what's in a private sector may look different than that in the Medicare sector. So, so we are committed to that. Just week before last, I did a webinar just looking at the proposed rules. Uh, so we, we think that's an important part of what the AMA needs to do. And I would just let, say... Let me just interrupt you for a second. That would include other payment models other than just the ACO. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I would just say that as I have gone around the country and looking at physician organizations, they are on board and trying to do that as well. So this is a big job. Uh, there are a lot of people who are involved, and we think it is important, and we agree with that. Well, and I, I just point out, I mean, I've already gotten some criticism in the Twitterverse for, for acknowledging that there were so many doctors on the panel. We would never had doctors on the panel when we were doing health care reform. I, I just do need to point that out. Uh, and I thought we needed you when we were doing health care reform. But it... it there's not a day that goes by that I don't hear from some doctor or some group who has some idea about this. And I dare say you can't go into a surgery lounge anywhere in the country where this problem wouldn't be solved within 15 minutes with time for coffee. Uh, now, Dr. Or Mr. Miller and Dr. Cherny, I need to ask you in what limited time I, I have left, both of what, when I heard you describe what you were proposing, I, I, I will admit to getting a very cold sensation because it sounded so much like capitation under the HMO model of the 1990s. How are, how are each of you different from a capitation? Well, it's different from capitation in a number of critical ways. First of all, it is risk adjusted so that you don't get penalized for having sicker patients. There are limits on the amount of risk that you would take. So if you get that unusually expensive patient, you don't end up having to pay for that all out of the same amount of money that gets covered. And there are quality uh, bonuses attached to it so that you don't end up being rewarded for delivering uh, low quality care. And I think that when we talk to physicians about this, um, I was just in Colorado this past weekend, had 100 doctors. Uh, we actually had them uh, sort of be inside the payment model and talk about how they would change care uh, because of the greater flexibility that they would have. Um, and uh, at the end, we said, so which would you rather be in, these new payment models or the existing payment model? And it was about 99 to 1. People said, I'd like to be in the new payment model because of the opportunities it gives me to be able to deliver better quality care. Dr. Chernoon, just very briefly. Um, I would just add. Uh, yes. All right. Are you finished your answer? All right. Apparently. Did, did, so, did you have something? You I was just wanting Dr. Chernoon to respond to the issue of capitation. The five year, I agree with everything Dr. Miller said, and, and the five-year uh, duration of the contract makes a big difference because if you're effective in lowering costs, they can't come in the next year and just lower and lower your capitation rate. The rates always go up, the, the, the capitation. I think that's an important thing. Okay. Thanks, gentlemen. And now recognize the uh, distinguished ranking member of the full committee, gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I know we try to be liberal on time, and 
I'll try to stay within the five minutes, but knowing the president, I'm sure I could go over. Uh, I have always been a supporter of allowing managed care choice for Medicare beneficiaries. In my district, Kaiser Permanente, Kaiser Health Plan and Permanente Medical Group have been leaders in providing high quality care at, at a reasonable cost. In many cases, however, managed care gets out of control and loses its bearings. Patients have been denied necessary treatment and care has been rationed by some private plans. Dr. Chernow, I want to address this question to you because your testimony describes the alternative quality contract that Blue Cross Blue Shield Massachusetts is pursuing. Can you tell whether and how that model guards against the incentives for doctors to deny needed treatment to their patients? Um, very briefly, there is um, the rates are set so that they don't go down, so no organization is forced to uh, reduce access to care. The, the rates go up at a slower rate than they otherwise might have. There's the quality uh, bonus system that protects against care, which includes outcome measures as well as process measures. It includes patient experience measures as well as just process measures. And um, our preliminary evidence suggests, in fact, that quality has, um, has risen under the AQC. And again, it tends to be a more doctor-oriented system where the doctors have autonomy to do what they were trained and want to do as opposed to ensure micromanaging the care. The doctors have much more flexibility, as Mr. Miller emphasized, than you might have um, in other systems. So I think it's a very doctor leadership friendly uh, design. Uh, in Medicare, of course, we're pursuing some similar projects in the form of accountable care organizations and other shared savings arrangements. Can you draw any lessons for Medicare from the Blue Cross Blue Shield Massachusetts experience to date? Uh, I do think there's a lot of similarities. I think some of the advantages that um, Blue Cross has had is, for example, you have to choose a physician, designate a physician. I think that's similar to the contracting that Dr. Williamson mentioned, but you have to pick a physician. That helps it work. There's upside and downside risk as some of the ACO regulation gets at. So I do think there are broader uh, lessons in the AQC, uh, the performance measures, but uh, we'd have to have a longer conversation to go into all the things. But there are, there are parallels, and I do think um, it speaks well of, of where some things in the Innovation Center are going. Many of the physician groups that responded to our letter, uh, bipartisan letter seeking comment, asked that Medicare allow physicians to choose from a menu of options uh, for different payment models in the future. Do you agree that Medicare needs to be able to deal with physicians and hospitals in a more personalized, uh, specific way, less of a one-size-fit-all approach? I do think that multiple approaches will be useful. I think they have to be structured in a way to avoid aspects of selection across the different programs. Um, but subject to those caveats, I think there uh, is unlikely to be a one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, as we look at the ways uh, to change the incentives in order to truly fix the payment system, we have to be sure we do not harm the quality of care in the process, and hopefully we build incentives that actually improve the quality of care. Uh, so, Dr. Miller, I was very interested in your ideas on regional health collaboratives. During my time as chairman of the Oversight Committee, a separate committee from this one, uh, one of the most striking things we learned was a, about was a project in Michigan that was implementing a checklist to reduce healthcare-associated infections. Many people took away from that the idea that we ought to have checklists. But what we also heard, and maybe more importantly at this hearing, was that the importance of people coming together to improve care, the checklist was only a tool to allow for collaboration at the local level. MedPAC has recently begun a discussion about ways to improve quality of care. They're contemplating changes to the Medicare quality improvement organizations and uh, her testimony from a regional health collaborative. Dr. Miller, do you think that the QIOs should be significantly modified to allow for more entities to participate? And can these collaboratives play a more direct role in payment reform aside from the critical role of improving quality? Well, I think the collaboratives are already doing around the country things that uh, we want to see happen. They are measuring and reporting on quality long before Medicare was doing that. Um, they have been working to uh, uh, work with uh, both hospitals and physicians to help them be able to uh, restructure the way they deliver care. Uh, Pittsburgh Regional Health Initiative in Pittsburgh was doing those uh, infection reduction projects uh, back in the 1990s. What everybody kept running into was the problem that the way the payment system was structured actually either didn't support the care changes that they had found would work or would penalize them for doing that. 
And so that's why we now see a number of the collaboratives around the country that are working on payment reform efforts and have brought together um, the c commercial health plans and Medicaid plans to agree on different approaches to payment. The biggest thing that is missing is, um, is Medicare being at the table. I think the QIOs in a number of communities, some of the QIOs are, are functioning as regional health collaboratives, and I think that in other cases they are working together. I think there is plenty to be done uh, to be able to improve the way the healthcare system works and roles for everybody. Uh, I think the issue is to have that local focus and to be able to have the kinds of improvement customized to what are the specific problems and the specific needs in that particular community. And that's what we don't have right now is a good system for being able to support that local customization. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen, and recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, uh, Mr. Guthrie, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess, of Dr. McClellan, I'll ask you this. Uh, since you were at CMS in the 2000s, I've been looking at the sustainable growth rate. I got elected two years ago, so I'm new at this, and I don't like to go back and say, well, there's a problem in the past, we have to fix it. But it would be kind of nice to know, since we're trying to come up with a new system, were you there when the sustainable growth rate was designed? Because uh, looking at the math of it, it ties, essentially ties it to the gross domestic product, That's right. which even the gross domestic product drops, people don't quit going to the physicians. So it seemed like a bad model to, to begin with. And I don't know if, if the people come together and say, you may not have been here, but just history of it, this was the right thing to do. And, and now we're here 10, 12 years later going, we have to do something different. Because my question gets to, whatever we do is gonna have to save cost in the system. Yeah. And so whatever system we have is gonna save the cost of growth, at least the growth. And right now it's a cut, it's not, it's not trying to slow growth, it's cutting, which is wrong. But I just wanna know the history of the SGR and why you think it was supposed to work and didn't. Well, I'll try to give you a brief history. I wasn't there back in uh, the days of the Balanced Budget Amendment uh, or the Balanced Budget Act that, that established the SGR more than a decade ago. It was driven, exactly as you said, by concerns about rising costs in the Medicare program and the need to find a way to take costs out. And, you know, unfortunately, the traditional thing that we do when we can't figure out uh, the, the direct way to save money while improving care is when all else fails, just cut the the payment rates, and that's what was built into the formula. So I wasn't here when that started. Um, I was here five years ago uh, at CMS, as you mentioned, when we, this subcommittee was also having hearings about the challenges of reforming the SGR. And I think what's happened in the five years since is a couple of things. One is the concerns about rising costs and the sustainability of the Medicare program have increased a lot, uh, along with the cost about the affordability of our health care system overall. And the second is we have a lot more evidence and a lot more leadership from physicians has come up repeatedly today on ways to do it better um, so that you don't depend on um, crossing your fingers that some statutory formula is actually going to be implemented. And you do depend on the people who are in the best position to do something about this problem, and that's physicians. So uh, the steps that we've talked about today, I think it's time to begin implementing them to, to move away from the SGR and save money at the same time. I agree. agree completely. I just want to kind of figure out, they were sitting here a dozen years ago saying this is going to fix the problem, but I guess people must have thought even when they did it, this really isn't going to fix the problem. So when you do, if, if things come as gimmicks and this is not going to work, you've got to have sustainable changes in, into that. The thing on quality of care, uh, a lot of times I talk about teachers and they say we're going to pay for the quality of instruction and how do you measure it? I mean the measurables come into play because a teacher says well if I'm in a school with a certain demographic then I may and I'm with a school with a different demographic I'm being compared to each teacher and so I mean how do you because if you have a, a, a less healthy population you're treating you're going to have less outcomes just by nature than if you have a healthy, out, uh, healthy group so how do you determine anybody want to talk how that would Dr. Hoyt? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, and, and the way you do that is, first of all, through statistical risk adjustment of patient population. So you are comparing apples to apples, physician to physician, practice to practice. Another formula. <laughs> and, and then secondly, uh, you, you, you really need to pick metrics that are going to uh, be relevant to improving the, the patient care process. And I think um, by having uh, leadership models like people have talked about, uh, we are actually training leaders to become qualitologists or quality leaders in organizations by having these interstate collaboratives so that we share best practice. And then what you individually do with a database is you array against a particular complication, let's say surgical infection, 
all the providers. That can be hospitals or that could be a uh, individual physician. And what you then get is the performance of all of those providers across that complication. You're going to have some outliers that are doing well, some outliers that are doing poorly. What happens is those people get together and they improve, and that is the, the, the effect we're trying well, to get. I only have 30 seconds, but the surgical infections is what the hospital's doing there. What about some of the behaviors that what the patient brings to it, like uh, uh, someone who is, is, is pregnant? So That, that, that needs an additional... And, and I know strategy. you want to incentivize having better prenatal care, but, but are there doctors that... I mean, that's what you want to do is say you kind of really manage that, but a lot of times it'll be different for different physicians based on the way their patient populations react. And how do you account for that? Well, I, I think that's an additional strategy. We, you know, in, in my field, trauma, the way we do that is you work on road traffic safety initiatives, you work on gun control or, or whatever because you're trying to go upstream from the problem. And every aspect of medicine has preventive areas that are essential. Chair, Chair, thanks, gentlemen, and recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Caps, for five minutes for questions. Thank you all for being here. I have long been a supporter of fixing the SGR problem. It's an issue that causes difficulty for providers and consumers alike. In addition, providers who are able to keep their patients healthier and lower overall costs are often penalized even more. But the conversation often stops at the crisis point. How do we make it to the next fix? Uh, and rarely moves on to one where we can discuss our vision for health care system in the future and how to get there. That's why I want to thank uh, Chairman Pitts and Ranking Member Pallone for, the, for bring, engaging in this important topic today. And I have two, uh, uh, a, an idea to bring before Dr. McClellan and Mr. Miller. Um, there's been so much talk about the role of doctors in the health care system, but if we're really going to move to a more comprehensive prevention-focused system of care, I believe it's important to acknowledge the role that other health care providers bring to the table in keeping our nation healthy, including nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, and many new kinds of models of delivering care. This hearing and many before it have drawn our attention to the need to move away from volume-based medicine and toward a more holistic model where the rewards are for providing great care for a patient rather than a lot of tests and procedures. As a nurse, I can tell you that nurses and nurse practitioners get that. In previous hearings, we've heard about how many successful programs, we've heard about some successful programs, for example, the guided care program at Johns Hopkins, and how they rely on nurse managers or nurse practitioners to provide the complex uh, uh, services that frail Medicare and Medicaid uh, patients often need. In addition, nurses have patient education skills that can help to manage uh, chronic uh, uh, diseases for, for many people. So, Dr. McClellan, will you talk uh, briefly about the possibilities for nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, and other non-physician practitioners in some of these new care models, like medical homes or accountable care organizations, please? And I'll turn to you, Mr. Every Miller. single one of these reforms has involved more reliance on other health professionals. I can't think of any, um, uh, not medical homes, not these episode-based programs to improve uh, surgical outcomes and reduce uh, complications, not programs for palliative and supportive care for patients with complex illnesses that don't rely much more than we have in the past on nurse practitioners, nurses, pharmacists, and other allied health professionals in delivering care. And that gets back to the core problem we've ta been talking about today, which is that Medicare's traditional fee-for-service program doesn't do much to pay for these other no. types of care. In order to target these services best to the right patients, though, you need physicians working with these other health professionals making decisions. You need more flexibility for them to, to lead, and that's hopefully where these payment reforms will take us. And so that's one of the areas where you want to see us go forward. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and, and, of course, underlying all of this is the shortage of primary docs, and everyone is fixated on that. Um, there are, uh, there, we need more incentives for people to rise to those kinds of primary, uh, primary care services from these other professions as well. I'm seeing you nod, so I think you agree. I think so, and just to go back to the example in Massachusetts that uh, Dr. Cherney was talking about, one of the features of that alternative quality contract is a lot more resources for primary care doctors to coordinate care, and some of them who I've talked to say they feel this is more like concierge medicine almost. They're able to really spend the time managing the patient's problems and aren't being reimbursed just on a short, you know, five-minute visit basis. Good. Okay, maybe, Mr. Miller, if there's time, Dr. Chernow, you might I, want to chime in, too. 
I organized and ran a project in Pittsburgh over the past three years to focus on reducing hospital readmissions for patients with chronic disease. We made a lot of changes in various procedures, but the most important single thing that we did was that we hired two nurses to work with those chronic disease patients to help them educate them to go into their homes to figure out what they needed to be able to manage their care better. We had to use a foundation grant locally to pay for them because they cannot be there's paid no, for by There's Medicare. no funding stream right, uh, right my, now. On the my board. instructions to the nurses when we hired them was your job is to keep 13 people out of the hospital the next year because that will actually pay for your salary and they beat that target by a significant amount. We reduced readmissions by 44 percent in the course of one year and we ended up having to lay off one of those nurses at the end because there was no way to continue her <laughs> under the current health care payment system. In the other case, fortunately, the hospital was willing to pick her up wow. and put her on salary to continue to do that work to help the patient stay out of the hospital. Great example. So the, the results are pretty short term. The results are, are quick. They are dramatic. Um, and the intervention is very simple. It is simply it is a perfect example of something where the current payment system does not pay for that. Now, whenever you do pay for it, you want to have them focusing on a specific target right. that will actually save you some money and not have that nurse diverted into doing all kinds of other things that might be desirable but will not save the program money. That's why whenever we did the program, we said <laughs> the focus is specifically on keeping, reducing readmissions of patients, and they were able to do that. And it was actually a very empowering thing for the nurses and for the physicians to be able to have that resource that they could use for their patients and be able to use it for the patients that they knew needed help but that they didn't have the time to be able to provide for them. Right. And I ran out of time, but I'm, I'll, I'll look for your written testimony, Dr. Tiernow, if you'd like to submit it, if you want to zero in or bore in on, on the way that this impacts uh, in the Massachusetts program as well. I appreciate that. I'll yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlelady, and now recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Dr. Cassidy, for five minutes for questions. Hey, Dr. Wilson, I'm also a member of the AMA. Um, and I like all your suggestions, except that I don't see how we pay for them. In fact, one of the, I was disappointed as many members of the AMA were in the AMA support of PPACA because, frankly, the low-hanging fruit of savings in Medicare didn't go to shore up Medicare or to fix the SGR. It went to create another entitlement, which arguably is going to make our situation worse. So do you have any, I don't see inherent in your testimony, now that the savings from Medicare have been used outside of Medicare, how we pay for this? Well, one of the challenges of the whole health care system is that, that the costs are multifactorial. And, and we have not, in this hearing, because it's not a part of this hearing, talked about the biggest driver for cost in this country in health care, we spend 78 percent of, of what we spend on health care on chronic disease. And so pre and most of that preventable. So uh, that's another area we need to be involved with. The, the area of uh, tort reform, uh, uh, CBO has suggested that uh, a cap of $250,000 on non-economic damages would reduce the federal budget by $54 billion over the coming years. Uh, so uh, we think there are a variety of things in this, in this legislation that will start to address that, and that's where we need to look. But it is a variety of things. There are uh, parts of this uh, legislation that look at the whole area of simplification, administrative simplification, insurance forms, things that don't contribute to health care. Let me interrupt just because I have such limited time. I always say, though, anything that creates, uh, quote, according to the CBO, innumerable boards, bureaucracies, and commissions does not decrease administrative costs. But uh, Dr. Chernow. Uh, now, I'm very interested in what you describe Blue Cross doing in Massachusetts. But on the other hand, Massachusetts, which is kind of the forerunner of PPACA, has the highest, I mean, literally the highest private insurance premiums in the nation. And so my concern is that, again, the forerunner of PPACA has resulted in the highest private insurance premiums in the nation. So how has the program you describe, which is incredibly intriguing, thwarted that, contributed to that? I mean, it seems kind of a discordance where you have high premiums and yet you have what on paper seems like an effective intervention. Right. I, I'm not uh, prepared to defend uh, all of Massachusetts and the differences of Massachusetts health care. Um, we could discuss at greater length. But I think the uh, easy answer to your question is the uh, AQC wasn't designed uh, initially to save money in the first year. As I mentioned in response to an earlier question, it doesn't lower the amount of money that any physician group gets paid. And in fact, if the physician groups are more efficient, uh, a lot of that's captured by the physicians. It's not captured by the plan. Um, 
the uh, goal of the AQC has been to uh, give physicians the power to control that trend through, say, for example, uh, it's very primary care centric the way uh, Dr. Uh, Gertz described. And so um, the evaluations of what it's going to do are ongoing, but ultimately its impact on spending and trends are specified in the five-year trajectory and relative to what had been projected in Massachusetts, which had been growing at about the same rate. Um, it was designed to save, to, to save money off of trend, not to lower fees. And so in the end, what matters is how much you allow the... Is there, is there an initial indication that it's saving money on the trend? There's only been one year of experience gotcha. yet, so... And then, let me, then let me ask you another, because I have such limited time. Now, the medical loss ratio, is that 15% in Massachusetts? I'm not aware of what the medical loss ratio is in Massachusetts. I, I, the only reason I ask that is because clearly there is an informational infrastructure required of the insurance companies. Yes. Now, on the other hand, if you have high premiums, again, if you have the highest in the nation, 15% of something high gives you something pretty high. 15% of in a lower state, which doesn't have this sort of precursor PPACA, which may be lower, that absolute dollar is less. Can you cor incorporate this with an artificial medical loss ratio of 15 I, I agree with the premise of your question, that there's going to be some spending that's not counted in the medical loss ratio that's very important to control spending, and you want to make sure that medical loss ratios don't impede your ability to innovate. And if that's the, the gist of your question, I agree with you. Okay, fantastic. Um, uh, Dr. McClellan, man, i got to tell you, I see my New England Journal of Medicine article which shows that ACOs and these demonstration projects which are picked to succeed, that they typically don't, concede, uh, don't succeed in terms of saving money. And when everybody says we're going to save money with ACOs and yet the best analysis from the best demonstration project show that they don't, how can we hang our hat on this, particularly after that incomprehensible rule put out by CMS? Well, setting, setting aside the rule, I, I think the New England Journal you're referring to summarized the experience under a demonstration program that we started while I was there. Um, and what it found was that out of the 10 groups that participated, every single one of those physician groups significantly improved the care for their beneficiaries. Uh, they led to significant overall savings in Medicare costs, and five out of the 10 got to levels of savings of two percentage points per year, which is in the, the kind of realm that would make Medicare. Now, now, if I may quote, it seems highly unlikely that the newly established independent practices would be able to average the necessary 20 percent of return on their investment. I'm quoting from the article. Um, the mean investment of one point C, uh, I can go on, but it actually disputes a little bit your, so, your assertion. So I think what the article is pointing out is that for physicians to change their practices in ways that improve care takes some investment up front. And if all they're getting is this shared savings on the back end, that by itself may not be enough. And that's essentially one of the core concerns that people have raised about the proposed regulation. And I agree. Uh, we need to be looking at reforms that give enough support up front to enable the kinds of uh, back-end savings to bend the cost curve. What we're seeing in a lot of the private insurers who have implemented ACOs is a combination of approaches. They don't just like pick one uh, and do that for five years and then wait and do something else. They're trying to comprehensively work with providers to solve this problem. So they do something like medical home payments uh, up front, as we've talked about before, more re resources for primary care. Let me interrupt. The chairman's been very generous, but we're already a minute 20 over. Yeah. I appreciate that. I'd appreciate your complete response. I'd, and I'd like, to, to, follow up with you I'd like to submit for the record something that Dr. Gertz would agree with from uh, Q Alliance regarding the direct medical home for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank, uh, Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And now recognize the gentlelady from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I also want to extend my gratitude to the panel for being here. Um, and also to uh, add my comments to those who mentioned earlier that it's great to see the bipartisan leadership of the subcommittee and full committee working together on, on this critical issue. Um, as we talk today about the importance of repealing the sustainable growth rate, we also have to focus on replacing the Medicare fee-for-service payment system with a model that has some better incentives aligned, um, rewarding quality, uh, controlling costs, and I'd like to sort of add the new layer of incenting us to involve patients as partners in their health care, um, something I haven't heard a lot about, but of course we have a panel of, of, um, of physicians, and I, I'm sure later uh, in this session as we you know, dig down in this issue that we'll hear uh, from patient uh, groups and, and that role too. Um, we're all representatives. We all represent certain geographical areas of this country. And as such, 
we tend to follow closely what's happening in our home turf. I happen to represent uh, South Central Wisconsin in the U.S. Congress, and I think, um, based on what I've learned from some of my home uh, state practitioners, there's a lot we can learn from what's going on in the state of Wisconsin. Um, providers there have been at the forefront of um, adopting innovative models that have demonstrated high quality and value. Um, they've uh, proved that implementing a system where there's a high level of integration and where doctors are responsible for managing patient populations can produce high quality um, uh, and low cost care. I, I guess I want to focus a little bit on one such delivery model that's produced successful outcomes in Wisconsin and Dr. Gertz has talked about it extensively in his testimony, the, the patient-centered medical home. That model focuses on the productive role a primary care physician can play in providing and coordinating care. And we know how important uh, the primary care field is in, develop, in, in improving health care outcomes. Um, they recommend preventative measures, help patients manage chronic conditions, and keep uh, patients out of high-cost uh, emergency room settings. I know all of you know that in a medical home model, the practice-based care team takes collective responsibility for a patient's ongoing care, and this team coordinates a patient's care across care settings and fields and maintains um, a personal relationship, uh, the patient, uh, with their personal care physician. One system in my district, uh, Dean Health System, uh, has tested the uh, patient-centered medical home model. And when establishing this model, they hit an initial roadblock, which um, was basically uh, finding that the fee-for-service model in Medicare, uh, i.e. rewarding volume, is inherently contradictory to the patient-centered medical home model. Uh, this model relies on primary care providers carrying out and providing a significant number of tasks that improve quality and enhance efficiency, but these tasks are not reimbursable uh, through the relative value unit-based compensation model. What Dean did um, instead was to establish its own reimbursement model to ensure sufficient reimbursement for um, this uh, primary care model. Their innovative approach has really paid off. The quality of care in the system's medical homes has improved notably, and these models have achieved considerable improvements in efficiency measures. Today, all of Dean's pilots have been certified by the National Committee for Quality Assurance. But furthermore, there's been uh, great patient feedback in terms of their happiness and satisfaction with this model. Their perception of access and um, satisfaction are higher um, for these patients who uh, receive care through their uh, medical home model. But perhaps the most notable achievement is that by embracing these innovative models, Dean has achieved significant cost savings. Um, overall, the system saw medical costs increase by only 2% in 2010 compared to the national average of 10.5%. Also, um, their pharmacy costs did not increase at all in 2010, while pharmacy costs across the nation increased 9% last year. The successes that they had and other provisor, providers in Wisconsin have achieved would not have been possible in this sort of fee-for-service construct. Um, for this reason, up to this point, the medical um, home model has really been limited to the private sector to the greatest extent. So, Dr. Uh, Gertz, could you elaborate a little bit on how moving away from the fee-for-service model and expanding the patient-centered medical home to public payers like Medicare um, could help realize the goal of providing this high-quality care for uh, a lower cost, but also the, this increased potential of involving patients in managing um, and, and in partnership with their physicians and nurses in managing their own care. Uh, thank you for that question. What, uh, one of the interesting things about the patient center medical home is when we evolved that in the early 2000s, we, we took in a, a, a lot of information from patients themselves about what they wanted and designed it. And to the chagrin of our members, we designed it without caring about how it was going to be paid for. And then we turned around and said, how are we going to pay for this model that we designed to give the care for patients the way we know it can be done and still have the resources to run the practices? So my response is the, the commercial payers and the models that they have already put in place show it works, but it takes looking at the entire spectrum of where costs are laid in the system. 
And until you allow us to look at the entire pan panorama of where costs are, you're never going to fix it. You, you just can't. And that the patient-centered medical home seeks to have the patient get the care where they need it by the right people in the team with, it, with out regard to those other pieces, and it, it seeks to involve the patient in how care is given. Chair, thanks, gentlelady, and recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Dr. Murphy, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, panel. It's good to see some of you here again. Uh, back in the 1990s when I was a state senator, I authored and we passed into law, we actually got bipartisan support, a patient bill of rights law. And much of that was dealing with, at that time, the problems of managed care, where we found out it was more about managing money from people outside the doctor's office and with insurance companies it really was than it was about managing care. So um, I'm wondering, uh, Mr. Miller, if you could elaborate a little bit more on this. So you and I have had conversations in the past, but uh, if you could give, and I apologize if you did some of this before, I had to run in and out to other things, maybe an example or two of how this actually works and we make sure the incentive is not to not provide services. Because the breakdown before of managed care was, as someone had a pool of money in their account, they, if they kept that money by not providing care. Could you tell us how it actually works to make sure they are providing better care? Well, in, in several ways. First of all, I think that it's important that this be controlled by physicians, not by health plans. And I think that's really the promise of um, uh, whatever the unicorn ultimately looks like uh, when you talk about accountable care organizations is that those really need to be controlled by the health care providers, the physicians, the nurses, et cetera, not by outside health plans. Uh, so that's number one, because I think they will be very reluctant uh, to deliver poor quality care. Second thing is to actually have good measurement of the quality of care so that they know how that they are doing uh, and the public knows how they're doing. And that's happening in a number of communities around the country that are reporting on the quality of care so that patients can make good choices. Um, I think the second thing, the third thing, is that um, there need to be choices about where patients can go, uh, which is why it's very important to not have requirements and regulations that only limit this to being very large organizations or that encourage consolidation of entities into one large monopoly, but to be able to let small practices be able to participate um, in this particular fashion. And I think that's what we, uh, there are models like that around the country where uh, physician practices are taking capitation payments, risk adjusted or not or otherwise, and are delivering very high quality care to their patients um, this, this because they are in control. This has become an issue, I know one of the battles we had was the issue of any willing qualified provider. And I always felt that if you eliminated people from being able to, providers from being able to compete by quality for service, um, they were out of the loop, and those, once they had lo locked in a contract, it was actually a disincentive for them because they didn't have the competition anymore. Is that what you're referring to by allowing patients actually to have some choices? Um, yes, that's right. And patients having choices based on both what the cost and the quality of the care is rather than either being locked into a particular provider because of what an insurance company determines um, or essentially having no choice because of the, um, uh, the nature of the organization and the community. So to have maximum number of opportunities to choose their provider I think helps to support that. I mean, this is an area that dealing with actual disease management is such a huge issue. Uh, in healthcare in America, and yet I'm still amazed that may, the way that Medicare and Medicaid work, designed in 1965, and I would venture to guess that none of us as healthcare providers would want to brag to our patients, by the way, I bought no equipment since 1965, haven't read a single medical journal or been to continuing education credit for 1965, I'm proud of it, but that's how our system works. You only get paid if you poke, prod, push, pull, or pinch someone, but not if you make them better. A second area I just want to, uh, you can, this whole panel can help illustrate what I think is the absurdity. So I'm, cor I'm correct in understanding that if someone is on Medicare and a physician is taking a you know, balanced billing and they say to the patient, you know, look, I understand you're low income. I'll just take whatever Medicare pays me and I'll leave it at that. They're not allowed to do that? Is that correct, panel? That's correct. That's correct. They're so if, if, I, if, if as a doctor I'm saying, you know, I'm just going to waive this. Here, you baked a pie for me. Good enough. Thank you, Mrs. Smith. You can walk away then that doctor's committing a crime? Civil and criminal penalties, yes, sir. And how big is the penalty? I don't have that number, I'm sorry. But it's big, civil it, and criminal penalty. It, it, it gets the attention of doctors. Uh, but, and, and, and if a doctor also says, you know, I think I can do this better by managing, by making calls to you, making sure you're taking your medication, like this is like 75% of prescriptions aren't taken correctly uh, from beginning to end, 
If a doctor decides to have a nurse in the office manage that call and take care of those things that actually keep that person out of the hospital, um, but doesn't even bill for that because they're providing a service, does this also go into the category they're doing something illegal? They're providing a service and care without billing for it? it that, that's not illegal. You just don't get any compensation for uh, helping the patient. Oh, that's okay. But it still comes down to, so if, it is absolutely amazing. And, Mr. Chairman, it, I, I hope we get more into this because the Medicare and Medicaid system, in my mind, are so hopelessly outmoded that the, only, the old tool when everything looks like a hammer, everything, when the only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And all Congress knows how to do is giveth and taketh away. We spend a dollar, we take away a dollar. But on this issue, to have spent nearly almost half a century of time using the same system without fixing this is preposterous. And I believe it has Im impaired a physician's abilities to work on these things to change the system. So th I hope we can get back to this in the future. Thank you. Uh, Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Lance, for five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon to this distinguished panel. Um, following up on uh, Congresswoman uh, Baldwin's questioning, uh, which I uh, found very interesting, uh, uh, Mr. Miller, you, in your testimony you do mention the accountable medical homes as being a, a, a type of transition payment system. Um, and in your comments you discussed developing specific targets for reducing utilization of health care services outside the physician practice. Uh, how would these uh, targets be developed and uh, are they ready to be employed in, in the near term? Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, the State of Washington and the Puget Sound Health Alliance have been working on this and are implementing that program uh, this month, uh, where a, a group of uh, small primary care practices around the state have done that. Now, getting there was a challenge uh, because, uh, first of all, you have to have the data to be able to determine what your current rates of ER visits and hospitalizations are, and that was a real challenge to primary care practices to even think about it because they don't have that data right now. Um, surprising enough, it was even difficult for some of the health plans to deliver that data to them, but once we were able to get it, it made clear that there were fairly high rates of uh, emergency room utilization for uh, non-urgent reasons. Um, and so the idea was to give the primary care practices some flexible resources that they could use to hire a nurse, to have longer um, uh, office hours, et cetera. And, to, uh, and we calculated that with uh, the kinds of reductions, uh, just to take ER visits, the kinds of reductions in ER visits that many of the medical home programs that Dr. Gertz talked about have achieved, that they would be able to save more money for the health plans than the amount of flexible resources that they were getting up front. So a number of practices have signed up to do that this year um, through the payment, and uh, the challenge locally was to get eight different health plans and Medicaid to agree. And, and, and Medicare is not at the table. And, and in your judgment, why is that the case? Why is Medicare not at the table? Because Medicare does not have a payment model now that would support that. Uh, in fact, Washington applied to be in the multi-payer advanced primary care demonstration and was not selected. And uh, so they, are, they will be actually, they will be saving Medicare money because yeah, they will uh, do it for all of their patients, yeah. not just their Medicaid and commercial patients, but they won't get the money to be able to support that at the level that they really need. Um, if, if, thank you. Um, in your uh, remarks, uh, uh, Dr. Chernu, in your prepared remarks, you, you state, and I'm quoting now, just to give one example, a colonoscopy performed in a physician's office costs Medicare on average about half of the cost if it is performed in a hospital outpatient setting. Uh, this largely reflects different treatment of the technical fee for providing the service, which may be justified, but it is difficult to assess the appropriate fee differential, if any, because case mix and other factors are hard to observe. Could you elaborate for me a little bit on that? Um, Sure. So uh, the fee-for-service systems are incredibly unwieldy, and ours is particularly unwieldy, and the amount you get paid for something depends on where it's done, because remember, there's payment to the physician, but there's also payment to a facility. And so if you move the service from one setting to another setting, in some cases the physician is getting both the professional and the technical fee, and in other cases the physician is just getting the professional part, the technical part is going somewhere else, but those technical fees aren't fixed it differs based on what's in the physician fee and what's in, say, the hospital setting. And so there's differences, and that's just one example of, of where the difference is. Um, 
it's easy to say that, well, we should just set them the same. The technical fee should be the same. And what people in the hospital would tell you is, yes, but the patients that we're seeing in the hospital have a whole series of other comorbidities. It's more difficult to treat them for one reason or another. Our technical fee, albeit higher, is justified because of some aspect of the patient or the care we deliver that's different than the care that's delivered if you're doing the same procedure in a physician's office. If you knew what that cost difference was, if someone came down from on high and told you this is what the cost difference was, you might be able to manage that reasonably well. So we, so we have a responsibility working together on a bipartisan capacity with experts uh, such as the distinguished panel here to try to uh, overcome that to, 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 to make it less expensive. So, so my view is we will be hopelessly mired in the morass of fee management if we stay for too long in a basically fee for service yes, system. I, yes. And so moving away from the system, in my view, is the long run solution. We have to mitigate the problems in the short run, no doubt. But I'm not a believer in the government's ability or anyone's ability to micromanage these crazy fee Thank schedules all that Thank well. Thank you. I hope we are not hopelessly mired in the system. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Thanks, gentlemen. That concludes the first round of questions, and we'll go now to follow up. I'll yield first to uh, Dr. Burgess for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Kurtz, if I could ask you, because this has come up several times on, uh, I think Dr. Wilson mentioned the 78 percent of the people in Medicare who suffer from chronic disease. So the universe of people that are, that are dual eligibles, and I think Dr. Williams said, said he would exclude those from the direct contracting, but honestly, that may be the group where you want to focus the direct contracting. If you provided each of the dual eligibles with a concierge physician, a navigator, a facilitator that could be with them through all this, maybe a doctor, maybe a nurse practitioner, we could argue about that, but it seems like that's, you know, Willie Sutton used to rob banks because that's where the money was. I mean, Dr. Berwick has told us this is where the money is. Dr. Wilson reaffirmed today that this is where the money is. Eighty percent of Medicare, which is a lot, is spent by 20 percent of the patients. What do you think about that? Our organization is in favor of any innovative model that addresses coordination and uh, information sharing among all the team members who need to take care of that patient. But here's the problem. Mr. Miller told us that Medicare has no payment model for that type of activity. Is that correct? Do I, did I understand that correctly? In our opinion, it does not. So really, all the smart people at the table, if you will tell us how to construct that demonstration project where we can demonstrate that level of savings, I mean, I'll be happy to take that to Dr. Berwick and spend some time with him and, and see if we cannot either administratively or legislatively make that change happen because, I mean, truly that is the, the low-hanging fruit that, that we should be talking about. Is that not correct? Does anybody disagree with that? So, again, we offer a challenge to the panel assembled here today. Help us, help us craft that as a whatever you want to call it, demonstration project or, or whatever, and, uh, and let's see if we can do so in a way. We've got to be careful because Dr. McClellan worked very hard on the physician group practice demonstration project with, Dr. with Secretary Levitt, and, and now, of course, we've got a series of rules that are unworkable. So it, it is, there is a problem in our system, and, and we've all identified it, but this is one that I would be, I would be anxious to work with you all on this, and, and even... You know, Dr. Williamson, I thank you for, for bringing the idea forward that, okay, we're, we, would, we would separate this group of patients out of direct contracting, but really, if we're going to save the money, we won't, we'll call it direct contracting because that upsets too many people, but let's help that group of patients navigate the system and, and spend dollars more efficiently. That's where we could perhaps do the, do the most good, not, not on the margins of the, of the people who, uh, who might, in fact, be a, in a direct contracting type of world. Yes, sir. Just say quickly, the models that we've talked about can help with that, but it's also an example of how you can't have one size fits all because some of those patients who need much more intensive help need to have a payment model that supports that, and it may be a, a lot of money for different things than they're getting now with the opportunity to save a lot of money on the other side. Um, and there's been a lot of attention recently to, for example, the Boeing model on the West Coast has focused on those, some of those highly complex patients. Project in New Jersey has focused on those kinds of patients and shown very significant savings. But you also have to have some very significant reach change in the way care is delivered and a payment model that supports yeah, that. And I, I would not quarrel with that. You know, one of the things that I've heard over and over again today when, when Ms. Capps was in here talking about nurse practitioners, very frustrating. I mean, again, Dr. McClellan and, and Secretary Levitt working on the Medicare Advantage program in the, in the mid-2000s, 
uh, which we, of course, robbed in the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act and have now given a waiver. But this was the whole idea, if I remember correctly. It was a disease management, care coordination, uh, electronic health records. You do all these things in, in return for perhaps a little bit more reimbursement in the Medicare Advantage system. Uh, Dr. McClellan, do I recall that system correctly? Yes, there have been a number of steps to try to get even specialized Medicare Advantage plans for dual eligibles and people with complex illnesses. And uh, uh, those programs can work, but you're right that this is the population that could benefit the most from well-coordinated care and has the most fragmented payment. So it's a, it's a lot of obstacles to overcome. Well, can we use that leverage and, and pivot, you know, perhaps our discussion of SGR reform to, to actually get to a more sensible system for those patients that are involved with spending the most money in the Medicare system. I mean, would that not be a correct approach to take? I, I agree, and I think it again highlights that, that the importance of this effort focusing on clear opportunities to improve care for particular kinds of patients, particular types of medical care, and recognizing that the physician payment system can make a big difference in that, but there are other changes that are going on and, and other opportunities. And, Medicare today to, to reinforce and, and support those changes through steps like um, the, the, the measures used in the Medicare Advantage program and the way that the Medicare Advantage program is set up. Those, those are all feasible. Well, let me just say, as, as just as a wrap-up, Dr. Wilson, I, I, I really want you to concentrate on the, on the maintenance of professionalism within our profession. As, as we see more of these things develop, ACOs, whatever the system is, there is an inherent danger for the doctor not to be the advocate for the patient. And historically, we know that is the correct relationship for the doctor to have with the patient. The health plan can't advocate for the, be an ad, ad, adequate advocate for the patient. The hospital can't be an adequate advocate. It has to be the physician. There has to be the maintenance of the professionalism within the profession. And I thank you for, for taking on that task. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, we are voting on the floor. We're going to try to uh, wrap this up. We, I'll recognize Mr. Plone for follow-up and then Dr. Gangry. I just wanted to um, ask uh, either Dr. Cherno or Dr. Miller. Um, you can both respond if you want. The idea that Medicare should abdicate its responsibility to protect seniors from exorbitant cost sharing in the name of private contracting, the, the idea that Medicare shouldn't place limits on the cost of care has not floated in a bill that was introduced by Representative Price and supported by some physician witnesses before the committee. Um, the idea of unlimited balance billing, of course, is not new, but it's, it's one of the oldest requests of providers in Medicare to be able to charge whatever you want. But I want to talk about the beneficiary impact. We don't have any beneficiary representatives on the panel here today, uh, which is a shame, but I, I note that AARP in a letter strongly opposes efforts to increase beneficiary costs through private contracting. As I understand it, this idea of balanced billing is not something that's very common in private sector networks. So maybe I'll ask Dr. Cherno, in, in your work observing private health plans, have you noticed a trend towards <laughs> allowing physicians to bill enrollees in network, whatever they like? And, and if, Dr., if Mr. Miller wants to respond too. I have, I have not noticed that trend, and I'll, I'll save longer responses if you want. Um, I think that the key thing is that there is no one change that is either desirable or necessary that will fix the system, that multiple things have to be done simultaneously, and um, that keeping the current fee-for-service structure and simply trying to fix it with one change may not uh, do the kind of thing that you want and may lead to other kinds of problems. I do think that it makes sense, though, that uh, patients have more sensitivity to the cost of services and that physicians and providers not be constrained as to whether they can deliver care based on what Medicare decides to pay them. So mechanisms that would enable them to set the right price, as Dr. Turner said earlier, as well as what the payment structure is, are going to be very important. But I think that you have to have a comprehensive set of reforms that changes the way the payment is made as well as what the patient's responsibility is. I mean, I just wanted to mention, um, you know, choices beneficiaries would be forced to make in this situation because they're just overwhelming. I asked my staff to look at what a patient would need to consider by way of prices in a negotiation with a physician over course of several treatment options for prostate cancer, for instance. And just to read a few, and maybe I'll enter it into the record, extensive prostate surgery, of which 
There are five variations listed for Medicare with prices ranging from 1100 to 1700 Removal of prostate, three variations ranging from 900 to 1100 Intensity modulated radi radiation therapy, seven, $567 per dose, but the number of doses required varies significantly from person to person. The dose plan for that therapy, $400 to 2100 I mean, just to give you some examples. Dr. Turner? I guess what I say broadly is um, the concern that I would have with these types of programs, uh, for starters, so actually let me say for starters, I believe in markets, I'm an economist, I like markets as much as the next guy, in fact probably more so. Um, I'm concerned in this case about market power, I'm concerned that while I believe consumers can drive down prices for iPads, I'm not so sure they can do that in healthcare for some of the reasons that you say. Um, in Ann Arbor, there was a situation where the faculty, I've, I've been told anecdotally, lobbied to get dental coverage uh, for routine care. It was $60. They got the coverage for $16 per visit. The prices went up to $120. Um, so I think if there's competition, you can solve these problems. I'm not so sure there always is and you have to be worried about. I think it's particularly hard in the Medicare population because you have a lot of people, at least like my grandparents, that are cognitively impaired. And so there's a concern about their ability to do some of these things. And obviously there's issues of disparities. My biggest concern would be that it would give uh, you all, frankly, a pass to keep Medicare rates lower than they otherwise would be. Um, and I think that you shouldn't have an excuse for underfunding Medicare. Um, and I worry that this might give you that excuse. But on the other hand, I haven't studied this particular uh, issue and I don't have a particular position on it, but I do have the concerns that I outlined um, going forward in, in such a way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Thanks, gentlemen. And we're running out of time. Dr. Gangry, you're recognized for questioning. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I'll try to get right to it. Uh, Dr. McClellan, I've got a, uh, a letter in, in my hand that was actually sent to the House GOP Doctors uh, Caucus uh, April 15, uh, 2011, subject reforming the Medicare physician payment system. The letter uh, advocates new payment model options including pay for performance, bundle payments to groups of physicians, or even blending elements of multiple models. Uh, the letter states that allowing Medicare to create multiple care models is important because there's no one-size-fits-all payment model that will achieve physicians and policymakers' objectives for improved care and affordability. Uh, I'm kind of quoting from the letter. What, what are your thoughts on the value of multiple care models as a solution to the SGR problem? Well, uh Dr. Gingrey, we've heard today there are a lot of models that can help support better care. I think what unifies them is not the jargon, uh, but the fact that they all can be linked to specific, meaningful steps to give patients better care that, uh, that the surgeons have identified, that the primary care physicians have identified, that, that all uh, of these leaders from medicine have identified. And by focusing the reforms that this committee undertakes on actually achieving those improvements in care, I think we can target them more effectively. I would emphasize that that not only means leadership for physicians on identifying uh, specific kinds of payment reforms, but also, but especially leadership on identifying how they can make care better by changing the payments, because Medicare doesn't support all of this now, and then accountability for doing that. You know, the, the, the quality impact, we've talked a lot about measures, and the cost impact too. And that, that is a challenge, but uh, we know so much more than we did a few years ago about this. You know, there's so much more physician yeah. leadership now on these questions, and especially with so many physicians in, in, uh, in the House, uh, hopefully we can have- Yeah, we got 21 now. Right. Yeah. Well, so I'll stick with you just for a second as uh, sort of a correlate to that. In your opinion, uh, does the solution to the SGR sustainable growth rate lie simply in reforming how providers are paid or do you believe a, re a review of how Medicare benefits are structured, whether we've talked about concierge care or even the private contracting, I know has come up a number of times this morning, might help bring about meaningful reform in physician payments? Be benefit reforms would re really help and would emphasize that a lot of these private sector implementations of payment reforms go along with benefit reforms to actually save beneficiaries money by giving them more financial support to stay with their meds, to, to take their meds, to stay out of the hospital. Well, I know uh, Dr. Williamson uh, also talked about that in his testimony, and uh, Todd, uh, I'll, I'll go to you on this. 
Uh, and you cite the benefits of private contracting uh, within Medicare, uh, including the ability for the physicians to charge seniors less than they pay today in their out-of-pocket cost. Uh, as a medical provider of neurology, why can't you charge a poor senior less than the Medicare required rate? We would subsequently be subsequent to penalties, criminal and civil, as I said. And, you know, I can tell you doctors want to do that a lot, but they can't. That's one thing that we frequently hear from our practice managers is you can't do this. And, you know, uh, our, our premise is that, is that doctors and patients should be free to define the value of that interaction. You know, the government has the responsibility to fulfill its promise to Medicare recipients. It was suggested earlier that private contracting might give the government a pass to not fulfill that promise. That's not what the Me Medicare Patient Empowerment Act is about. It wouldn't change any of the existing benefits that patients now have under Medicare. What it would allow is patients to have the option, if they could afford and they chose to, to spend their own money on their medical care and it would not require them to forego their Medicare benefits if they want to see a doctor outside the Medicare system, as they have to do now, which we think is wrong. And we think it's wrong for a doctor to have to opt out of Medicare for two years if he or she provides care and accepts payment for that care to a Medicare patient. I had another part to that, but, Mr. Chairman, I know we've got about a half a minute left on the boat, so I will uh, yield back and just say thank you to all seven of our witnesses. You all have been fantastic today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Um, this has been an excellent hearing, excellent testimony. I think we've taken a big step today in moving beyond previous discussions of the deficiencies of the sustainable growth rate system to an examination of the kind of payment and delivery system we need and how to get there. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of the groups that responded to the committee's bipartisan letter asking for their suggestions. Their input has been very valuable. And I want to thank this distinguished panel of experts who took the time to testify here today in an effort to help solve this difficult but extremely important problem. I want to remind the members that they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record. I ask that the witnesses all agree to respond promptly uh, to those questions. With that, the subcommittee is adjourned.